Thank you uh, very much. Um, <clears throat> it's been moved by Councillor Yanetsky that the minutes of the regular meeting held February 9th and the special meetings uh, held February 9th and 23rd and May 9th, 2015 as mailed to the Mayor and Councillors be accepted. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Are there any uh, disclosures of pecuniary interest? None? Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, work. Okay. Councillor Marsh. If you can just click yourself in. Go ahead. Uh, just regarding the, um, the tender, <clears throat> sorry, the number is not in front of me. Uh, regarding the tender, uh, T1521, water heaters, preventative maintenance inspections, I have a, um, a pecuniary interest. Yeah. Okay. It's our family business. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so we'll deal with that uh, tender separately when the time comes. Any other uh, disclosures? Okay, if not. Uh, you'll note the communication referred to file, the flag request under policy uh, I-442 for Trillium uh, Gift of Life. Uh, we'll now then move into the presentations. Uh, Ms. Bonfont uh, from the Flag Waivers of Waterloo Region, unfortunately uh, was not able to uh, be here this evening. Uh, she advised us that she was going to uh, have to uh, cancel at the last minute and will be rescheduling at a later date. So with uh, that, I'll move on to our next delegation, and I will remind uh, both presentations and delegations that you have five minutes to make your presentation. Uh, and I will welcome uh, Sam Bess from, as the president of the KW International Children's Games Committee uh, to come forward. Welcome, Sam. Thank you. Mayor Verbanovic, members of council, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you this evening on behalf of the KW International Children's Games. The very first International Children's Games were held in Slovenia in 1968. The purpose of the Games was to create an event that would foster a better understanding amongst children of different cultural backgrounds, as well as promoting peace and harmony worldwide through sport. In the past 48 years, the Games have attracted over 45,000 participants from over 80 countries from all five continents. These Games are considered to be the largest gathering of youth taking part in sport in the world. This past December, Kitchener and Waterloo sent two delegations to attend the Games hosted in Lake Macquarie, Australia. In all, 16 swimmers from the Rose Swim Club, along with one coach and two heads of delegations, headed down under to represent our community. Joining us here this evening are some of those individuals that competed in Australia. I would like to introduce them to you now. Please hold your applause until all names have been read. Amy Z, Mackenzie Bender-Jones, Megan Sawatsky, Maya Hamley, Ryan McKenzie, Michael Lee, Craig Dotty, Stephanie Zhang, Felicia Nagoyan, Kelly Rombu, Sarah Shear, Aidan Elliott, Braden Redlickstow, and our heads of delegation, Vera McKenzie and Robbie Mulder. The next Summer Games are scheduled for June 2015 in Alkmaar, Netherlands, followed by Winter Games scheduled for Innsbruck, Austria in January 2016. Planning is well underway to attend both of these games, and once again we hope to deliver that once-in-a-lifetime experience to our local athletes. In closing, I would like to thank the members of our board, the City of Kitchener, and their staff for their ongoing commitment and support. As volunteers, we invest our time helping to develop tomorrow's leaders through the, division, through the provision of sport and recreation programs in the community. We do, this with much, we do this with much pride and are rewarded knowing that as Canadians, we do have a responsibility to be leaders in the promotion of peace, peace through sport as we step onto the world stage. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Maya Hamley, swimmer with the Kitchener delegation. Maya would like to share with you some of her experiences as an athlete participating in the Lake Macquarie Games. I thank you for your time this evening. Thanks, Sam, and welcome, Maya. 
On Monday, December 1st, 16 athletes, two head of delegations, and one coach set out for a trip of a lifetime. After an exhausting flight, we arrived in Sydney. Many great things were planned for us in Sydney, such as a speedboat tour of Sydney Harbour. On the tour, we saw the Sydney Opera House and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. We also got to spend the day at the zoo and meet and touch koalas, as well as see many other exotic animals found in Australia. The only thing we won't miss about Sydney is the McDonald's breakfast. Next was Lake Macquarie, where the competition was being held. Immediately, many of us started making friends from different countries by trading Canadian by trading Canadian goods. They also planned great activities for us, such as the beach party and the movie night. This is where we could connect as friends instead of competing athletes and get to know more about each other. Some of us still talk to the friends we made and maybe one day we will see them again. We also enjoyed being able to compete against people from other countries in our own sport, but also watching other sports such as gymnastics and water polo. The games affected me by giving me the curiosity to travel and experience other cultures. I'd like to return to Australia to walk across the Sydney Harbour Bridge and see the Great Barrier Reef. Going to Australia made me want to be more adventurous when I travel and meet more people from other countries. We would like to thank Sam, Vera, Robbie and Connor who took care of us and worked hard to organize this trip. We would also like to thank the City of Kitchener for their support and sponsorship. Lastly, we would like to thank our parents for the hours of fundraising and meetings to make this trip possible for all of us. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you uh, to uh, both of you for coming in uh, tonight and sharing uh, your experiences with us. Uh, thank you to uh, Sam and the, the board and, uh, and the uh, parent volunteers who I know uh, worked uh, many months fundraising and uh, helping support all of the, uh, the students so that you could uh, have this uh, amazing experience. And uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from uh, future groups as uh, you come, uh, as you venture on to other places for either the winter or the summer games in, in the future. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, delegation then is uh, Bruce McNeil, past president of the Kitchener Horticultural Society. Welcome, Bruce. Mr. Mayor, uh, councillors, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on behalf of the Kitchener Horticultural Society. I could have brought you a whole bunch of pretty pictures, but I know that you've all been to Rockway Gardens about three or four times last year, and you plan to be there three or four times this year, so I didn't want to spoil it for you. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the society and our stewardship of Rockway Gardens. As some of you will know, the society is a member of the Ontario Horticultural Association. It is one of nine societies in District 19 that features the largest horticultural society in Ontario, which is Kitchener, over 540 members, and the two fastest growing horticultural societies in Ontario, Waterloo and Cambridge. In 2016, District 19 will be hosting the annual Ontario Horticultural Association Convention in this region. The convention will bring society members from around the province to the area, and one of the bus tours for convention goers will feature a tour of Rockway Gardens and other sites in the region. The Kitchener Horticultural Society, with your support, has been managing Rockway Gardens since 1928, over 85 years. We couldn't do it without the city's support and have it be a botanical garden that is recognized around the province. We attempt to manage as cheaply as possible and yet produce a quality product that you and the community can be proud of. We keep costs to a minimum, yet seek, our quali seek out quality products. The society supervisor, Al Chivas, who used to be a, a member of the city staff, propagates almost all of the annuals we use at Rockway Gardens from cuttings and seed. The plants are propagated in, in a greenhouse in Maryhill 
that is owned by Fred Drexler, a friend of the society and a relative of the Janssen's early supporters of the gardens. Society insurance last year was moved to a pool with other horticultural and agricultural societies, decreasing our costs to a third of what they had been previously, from over $8,000 to around $2,000. That sounds like a quarter. Sorry, math not very good. Public liability and property damage is covered through the city pool, and spring bulbs are purchased as a bulk purchase with the city, and we use an awful lot of volunteer support. We encourage and receive support from groups, business, and industry around the province. The last four significant changes to the gardens were achieved through donations from Mothers Against Drunk Driving, the Zonta Club, Friends of the Environment, the Kitchener Lions, and the Horticultural Society. Donations are also received from local business in support of the concerts in the gardens and from members of the community in memory of relatives and friends who have passed away. The Society works hard to promote horticulture in our community. We use Rockway Gardens as a teaching resource and cooperate with the Kitchener Public Library in their Get Set to Grow program that is accessible to any member of the community at no charge by providing speakers. The Society has also co-sponsored with the Kitchener Public Library do you have one minute? Go ahead. Okay. A CD Saturday event that brings vendors, uh, seed vendors, nonprofits, speakers, and the community to an exchange of information and the opportunity to purchase product. We take part in a number of community activities such as Kitchener Blooms and Block Parties. The Society is a sponsor of the Kitchener Master Gardeners and a, and a concert in the Garden series. We have some challenges to face in the next couple of years that include the replacement of a deteriorating irrigation system. We know that with your support, we can deal with them effectively and efficiently. Thank you for the opportunity to manage the gardens on your behalf and for your continuing support. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce. Uh, any questions? If not, uh, just on behalf of Council, I want to thank you for the, uh, the many years that uh, the Horticultural Society has played such an integral uh, role in our community. I know you uh, not only do an incredible job at, the, uh, at Rockway Gardens, but also in terms of some of your programming at uh, the library and, and other places. And uh, you're a real asset and we're fortunate to have you and, and all the volunteers um, in our community making it more thank beautiful. You. So thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. So we'll now move uh, into delegations. Before uh, I do that, I should uh, acknowledge that uh, we do have uh, a uh, sort of an, an 11th member of council right now and would like to uh, just uh, congratulate our colleague, uh, Councillor uh, Kelly Galloway-Sealock. You may uh, hear that the 11th member sometimes isn't uh, always uh, the most, uh, doesn't necessarily listen to the chair in terms of when he can and can't speak, so we apologize for that in advance. But uh, welcome, Tyson, to uh, your first council meeting. Uh, with, uh, with that, we'll move on to uh, 6A. Uh, and is anybody here with respect to the bylaw to close a portion of Donnelly Street? There is not, so we will deal with that issue later on then uh, when we deal with uh, the, uh, the bylaws. Uh, next up then would be uh, Dan Proveno, Vice President of the KW Badminton Club. everybody. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you, councillors. My name is Dan Pronovo. I'm the vice president for the KW Badminton Club. Before we begin, I'd just like to uh, thank Councillor Etherington for all the support and help over the years to the club. Thank you. No. Uh, how do I advance the slides here? Colin, thank you. I'll let you know. Before I begin, I'll just start with a brief history of our club. We've been playing badminton at 69 Agnes Street for 80 years now. Not a lot of people know that necessarily. Uh, you may know it as the old Granite Club. 
The curling club left about 12 years ago to relocate in Waterloo. We stayed, and in November of 2013, we purchased the building. So we're very proud of that. We've put in already in that short time about $300,000 of renovations into the building. And our plan is to continue to renovate and restore this wonderful old building to what to its former glory, to build a multi-sport center that serves the community at large for Kitchener and the core of Kitchener. We're a nonprofit organization. Our mission and mandate is to promote badminton in the region and in Kitchener. We have over 400 members, have had that many for many years. We're at 450 right now, and we're continuing to grow we're, uh, and doing very, very, very well. Um, and I'm happy to announce that we have, in fact, secured our first anchor tenant uh, for the building, Battle, which is Backyard Axe Throwing League, uh, who will be starting in the spring, very soon, actually, joining us in the building. Next slide, please. Thank you. For those who don't know where we're located, we're kind of at the corner of Park and Agnes and Dominion. We have two parcels of land, our main building, and then that triangular lot, which is a separate parcel, which is the purpose of me being here today. Next slide, please. So, uh, specifically, we're here about the Dominion Street sidewalk. On the north side of, of Dominion, uh, across from our little lot there, there is a sidewalk, but there's no sidewalk on the south side, and staff, planning staff, uh, intend to put a sidewalk there because there was, uh, during all construction, that is part of their mandate and mission is to always add sidewalk. Uh, we only found out about this uh, not even a year ago last May from an on-site visit. It was like, oh, we're planning to do this. It's like, oh my gosh, uh, that's a problem for us because it's going to take away two to three meters of our parking lot. And it, because of its shape, that's very disconcerting. We'll lose six to 12 of our parking spaces, depending how much they claw back, of our 27. That's important because we rent our parking lot to Sun Life during the day when we don't have a lot of activity and can make do without it. That's over $12,000 of income a year. And more importantly, as we grow, and we're already adding one tenant to build this multi-sport center for the, for, for, to serve Kitchener, we need more parking spaces, not less. And I should add, the parking lot has been existing as it is there for 50 years. Um, indeed, it is an encroachment onto the city land, I guess, that our parking lot is on, but it's been this way for 50 years as a precedent. Next slide, please. So people understand the visuals of what I'm talking about here. This is the lot in question. The white line represents the edge of the north side of the parking lot. The yellow line on the inside is about where the city the planning staff want to claw back the lot to, which is basically a row of cars. And due to the shape, that really impacts how many spots you can actually get in there. And I should point out that there's parking lot everywhere else. Uh, in front of our building on Agnes, on the other side of Agnes on the lot, on Park Street and the north of Dominion. Next slide, please. Uh, Councillor Etherton helped us out last year and arranged a meeting with the mayor himself and planning staff, and we're very happy to announce that and work together to a mutual plan, which was to effectively shift the lot. So the idea is to close the little bit of street in front of our building, the little bit of Agnes there, turn that into just city land, not make it a road anymore, allowing us to shift the lot. They would have to remove the sidewalk. Next slide, please. Uh, the challenge with that plan, unfortunately, is that there's a lot of process the city has to do to actually um, uh, close down that street. And it's going to be months to maybe years to complete. Uh, and they want to go ahead and put in the sidewalk in June of this year, which is going to impact us gravely. What we really are here in council today is to ask for your support to try to minimize this plan and effectively delay the sidewalk installation until such time the city can work with us to move our parking lot so that there's no negative impact. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, some questions for you. Uh, Councillor Etherington. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, to Dan. Um, Dan, the solution we came up with, are you saying that that has changed or is it still going ahead? Uh, my understanding from last uh, conversation uh, with Mr. Allen is that it, they, are, they are working towards that plan of closing that street, but it's rather complicated and it involves adding new encroachments to remove the sidewalk along Agnes. So it's in process, but I've been given absolutely no dates as to when to expect it. The sense I get is a long time because there's quite a bit of process involved. Okay. And when and if that happened, the sidewalk would be removed from that portion of Agnes. Is that correct? My understanding is that for some reason, planning staff are comfortable with removing the bit of sidewalk along Agnes on the south of the lot. 
in favor of putting the sidewalk along Dominion. Right? I can't really speak as to why that's the case. So one of your key problems is you need a, as fast as possible, you need to know where you're going on this. That's or right, it would be helpful. What, what we would like is that the sidewalk in Dominion is not put in until our lot can be shifted by, by all the various city changes to the land and whatnot, and that we can have our lot basically moved over onto the sidewalk on Agnes. We just would like that delayed, because it could be 12 months, maybe longer, while we're short the space. And that we'll lose our contract with Sun Life, and we will ultimately uh, be short of parking spots as we try to grow this building to serve the community. Right. Mr. Mayor, my other questions, I think, would be better handled by staff. Can I ask those now, or do you want me to come back? Uh, I have several other people, so if you can uh, come back, that would okay. be helpful. I would. I also uh, want to remind Council, if you haven't had a chance, that Mr. Reedman did uh, send Council a note earlier today, um, and so uh, I presume that uh, staff can speak to that if necessary. Councillor Yanetsky. Yeah, thank you for coming in, Mr. Pronovo. Uh, just to get a better understanding, your concern basically is the loss of parking spaces as opposed to the sidewalk. If you shift the parking, 10, 15 feet, whatever it is that the staff requires. So as long as you've got that, that's your main concern. Then it's the timing. Absolutely. Of, okay. That is correct. We have no issue at all with adding a sidewalk on Dominion Street as long as we don't lose parking lot. We understand the value to the neighborhood and can appreciate why these rules are in place. We just don't want to have this impact to our lot, losing, these park, losing that extra three meters of space. So we're, we like the plan that yeah. we've worked with with staff and, and with the help. So with the shift, if that's the intended shift, would Agnes Street become closed or will it still remain open? I believe my understanding from staff, and staff would probably best address it, but my understanding from our meetings is that that little bit of stretch of street would no longer be a street. That to allow the shift of our lot, they actually have to close the street because they have to add an encroachment. And my understanding is that it's very difficult to do things like that on a road, but once it just becomes open city land, then you know it's very easy. Plus, they don't really want that bit of street. It's a bit redundant. So when I saw the drawing that you had the air, fo the air, air photo, was your access into the parking lot from Agnes Street itself? Uh, may I ask uh, if we can go back to the to the drawing, please? One, one maybe yes, Councillor. Sorry, I didn't. Sorry, know. how do you get into that parking lot? Do you come off of Agnes Street? You would come off Park Street from the bottom, and there's a little entrance there on Agnes, um, which you can't really see, but there's a little bit of a cut in the greenery. So at the bottom of the slide, you go up yeah. Agnes and turn left. Okay, so, is, uh, so are they intending to close that as well? No. Are you closing that Agnes bottom, it, my understanding is that that entrance at Agnes would be the entrance to the club. And they would close the top where you see a little white car there. Right. My understanding is that they intend to just close that off so that it would effectively uh, just be a, a roadway. There is public parking in front of our building. That is city parking in effect, although it's basically used just for the club. Um, so my understanding is they close the top and the entrance will be off Park Street at the bottom. So basically you want to delay the Dominion Street side sidewalk until you can move your parking lot over and not lose parking spaces and any revenue and all that stuff. So it's a matter of Correct. working the details out with staff then. Correct. Okay, and I think Mr. Uh, Justin Redmond's uh, email asked for deferral. No, no Mr. Delay? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Reedman's email uh, has suggested that staff plan on directing the contractor to hold off on the sidewalk installation until August. Uh, they'll work on the road closure process, uh, reference plans, and so on, and expect to bring a report back to committee council in June. So, based on what the mayor just uh, read, would that be acceptable to Justin? you? Yeah, the timing. Oh, sorry, fine. I didn't see that you were here, Justin. Come on down. <laughs> oh, oh, there he is. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> didn't see him hiding up there. <laughs> we we have no issue whatsoever with the timing. It's perfectly fine. Whenever the city wants to do this, our only concern is is that the sidewalk goes in, it captures away part of our parking lot, and there's a, a period in between where it's been cut back. We don't mm -hmm. mind at all. We're happy to cooperate with the city and staff to arrange whatever schedule fits them. Okay, I have no further questions of uh, the delegation, but maybe I'd like to hear what Mr. Reedman has to say at the appropriate time. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see Mr. Taggy, you wanted to add something at this point? 
Uh, Your Worship, just uh, uh, what you said that our uh, process will be, we'll try to expedite uh, the two things uh, together, which means uh, we'll hold off the uh, uh, construction of sidewalk to the end of the contract, perhaps near, the, uh, near August. And in the meanwhile, we'll bring back a report to council uh, to close the street. So the two processes hopefully can come to a point where the uh, time between uh, uh, the uh, removal of the existing sidewalk and uh, closing of the street, the time frame will be as short as possible. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Reedman, did you want to add anything uh, before I continue on with council? No, you're okay? Okay. Councilor Fernandez then. Actually, I just, as long as that is very clear, I think that that seems like a good compromise to you, does it? Okay. Uh, very negative for us if, you know, we work to that plan, but say we get to August and nope, we still can't move our lot because we don't have permission or the city hasn't completed the various bylaw changes or whatever is required, and then the sidewalk goes in. So as long as it works, yes, that sounds wonderful. We're very happy. Okay. for that solution. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ridman, um, you, you'll keep in contact with um, the Badminton Club as the, the report comes to council in June? Through the chair, that's correct. We can um, update each other f frequently throughout the process. Okay. I think that, that would be good, good uh, cooperation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Davey? Uh, sir, of staff. Okay. Uh, Councillor Singh? Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, well, this is of staff, too, actually. So. Okay, oh. I'll come back. Uh, actually, uh, well, no, I'll start with Councillor Etherington. He was the first one with staff questions, so you can click in. Councillor Etherington? Well, my first question to staff is perhaps they could give us an explanation of why the sidewalk would have to go in at all on Dominion Street. I presume it's, it's uh, the usual um, pedestrian policy. Is that correct? Through the chair, that is correct. Um, our policy direction is to install sidewalks on both sides of every, every street. This is a missing segment along Dominion um, that through the reconstruction process is an opportunity to fill in that gap. Um, we agree with the delegation that Agnes is an underutilized street. Um, there are utilities through that corridor, so we would need to maintain access to the utilities. And perhaps you could explain to me I mean, I'm satisfied with the way this is going, but why is it okay to remove the sidewalk along Agnes in preference to adding one along Dominion? Through the chair, we are proposing to keep the sidewalk that abuts right in front of the building. It's the sidewalk that would be in the middle of the parking lot that we're proposing okay. to remove. I understand. Thanks very much. Do you have any comment on the timing of this? Do you have any doubts about whether it'll be August? Through the chair, I've spoken with Steve Allen today, um, and he has indicated that he's talked to the contractor, and August is a reasonable time frame to push back the sidewalk construction. Um, working with legal, we've talked about the timelines, and they, they need about two months to finish their required work, so we can bring back a report to, to council at um, June. Okay. And Mr. Mayor, if, it, if it's necessary, I'm prepared to make a motion to that effect. It may be unnecessary. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to you, maybe yeah. good direction. Mr. Proveno, by the way, thank you for your delegation. You can take a seat. Uh, and we'll uh, continue with the questions and then the motion. Uh, Councillor Davey, you are next. Thank you, and I'm just anticipating, I just, I just think I just heard this is all gonna be coming back in a report, but I just wanted to ask if I can ask. So the city owns this Agnes Street and we're going to grant that land to the, is that the, there's, there's no money changing hands? Through the chair, we're keeping ownership of the land. Um, we are closing it um, as, a, as a public right-of-way, um, but keeping utilities through that corridor. But they'd be able to convert part of it to a parking lot? Through the chair, that's correct. Okay, I'll wait for the report. Thank you. Councillor Singh? Yeah, my question was answered through the earlier question. Okay, so with that, uh, Councillor Etherington, uh, you're moving a motion that... Uh, we that staff undertake the action indicated in Mr. Reedman's uh, email earlier today and bring it back in uh, in the report back in June and defer the sidewalk until August. That's what I thought the, your written motion said. So, uh, <clears throat> do I have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Singh. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously. Great. Thank you very much for coming in.
Uh, next we have uh, Mr. Paul Britton from uh, MHBC Planning uh, with respect to 508 New Dundee Road. Welcome Mr. Britton. Thank you Mr. Mayor and Council. I'm appearing together with uh, our client Mr. Charlie Ormston and his associate David Graham and we are collectively appearing in support of the Heritage Kitchener recommendation which is on the last page of your agenda and that recommendation relates to 508 New Dundee Road and it's a recommendation to proceed forward with the notice of uh, intent to designate 508 New Dundee Road and specifically the, uh, the stone house with uh, good reasons for the designation. I'll be very brief, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to confirm that we have worked uh, quite collaboratively with your staff in developing a shared vision for designating the property under the Heritage Act. And I wanted to acknowledge the excellent work of um, your staff and in particular, Michelle Drake and Katie Andrew. And um, also the positive recognition uh, from your Heritage Committee is noted. So on behalf of Mr. Ormston, we are here to ask that you support Heritage Kitchener's uh, recommendation as listed on your agenda. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Councillor Fernandez has a question. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that I'm pleased that uh, we're moving forward on uh, designating this as a, a, a piece of land of cultural heritage uh, value and interest. And uh, I appreciate Mr. Ormston's work with our staff and, and with the community as well. I think it's a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to recognize uh, the, the property at this point in time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Britton. Thanks. Do I have a mover? Moved by Councillor Fernandez, second by Councillor Yanetsky. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Okay. Um, Next, uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, next, uh, we have Mr. Harold Druitz. He's on his way. Okay, um, I guess we can potentially deal with it uh, later on. Um, so the next uh, delegation is uh, Ms. Moira McGee. Uh, I'll require a motion first. Ms. McGee is uh, registered as a delegation to speak on utilities and bylaw enforcement. I'll need a motion to uh, hear her. Moved by Councillor Fernandez. Second by Councillor uh, Ioannidis. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Ms. McGee, as per uh, Council policy, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation, but uh, Council won't be able to uh, uh, ask any questions since uh, this issue wasn't on the agenda tonight. Oh. Welcome. Thank you. Anyways, here I am again, unfortunately. Um, okay. Here's what I can say. <laughs> Having been the treasurer on the horticultural board, that chap's great. Anyways, also, being a homeowner in this region for over 25 years, I have always paid my taxes and I have always paid my utilities. And that is despite raising a very medically fragile and chronically, clinically ill child in this community. I advocated for many others who weren't able to manage quite as well as I was able to manage on and off social assistance to allow my schedule to care for my child who often required 24 hour care. When I began to realize that I was really going downhill because there weren't any mental health services for me to manage my complex PTSD of a chronic type, given I continue to be continually bullied by police and politicians in our region, I looked into the LEAP program, which is a low income energy assistance program. It's through the province of Ontario and it's, administer it's administered out of the regional municipality with their discretionary benefits. I qualified for that in the summer, in August, and I cancelled my automatic debit for my utilities because in order to now receive the income, which is $500, they would have given me a $500 break on my utilities, 
which I am so proud I never had to utilize prior to now. And uh, so I advise the city, you can continue to take my taxes out of separate debit, as it was always happening, but my utilities, my water and my gas, will have to go into arrears in order to allow me to qualify. So they were aware of what I was doing, and I was very careful to take careful notes. As it progressed through the months and I was running for regional chair, I can assure you it was most difficult to see my credit rating, an R1 credit rating, maintained as a single parent raising a child with often incomes that were less than a thousand dollars a month and expenses coming out of the hopper while we were going all over North America, including California for care. I manage my money extremely well. So it was hard to look at it. I also wasn't able to go on a regular basis to my, my mailbox because my neighbor, Gregory Booter, recently is no longer restrained from me. Prior to this, his probation orders, his probation order meant he couldn't come near me and I had some comfort. Now, because we are not enforcing the bylaws and his behavior continues and escalates, it's even difficult for me to go to the mail. But nevertheless, it ran into arrears and here's what happened. The city of Kitchener took my utility arrears and rolled it over into my tax account. And on January 1st, no less, what an insult, emptied my bank account. On January 1st, 2015, the city of Kitchener emptied my bank account. So my ODSP check went in there of $1,098. And it's gone. I have no money to eat, and that creates a blue, 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 and you can just imagine that all the fees and everything adds up using the Municipal Act to do that, knowing I was waiting to qualify for the Regional Assistance Program. So what I've suggested that you all do, and I think it makes perfectly good sense, is it's a paper project. You re right now, I've canceled my taxes too. So now my taxes are going in arrears, my utilities are going in arrears, I'm no further behind, I'm a lot further, I'm no further ahead and I'm a lot further behind. So essentially, if you guys would just kindly please develop some kind of a way that you can do this, and I'm sure you can, it's a paper project only, you take all the money that you took on January 1st that was allocated to my arrears and my utilities, and you credit that to my tax, my tax account, which will bring me up to date on my taxes. You then generate an, a bill that says, I owe the city of Kitchener this. Well, Ms. Begiva, if you can just uh, I'm almost wrap done. up. Yep. I'm almost done, Your Worship. I'm almost done. Yep. I'm doing really well here. Don't you, you think? I'm very calm. You are. Thank you. If you I'm can, on new blood pressure medication. You can try to wrap up. I'd appreciate that. Right. So anyways, what can happen here? is that will generate an arrears notice. That arrears notice immediately goes to OW, who administer the region's program under their discretionary funds, and you get paid immediately. And then you aren't owed anything, I don't owe anything, I've had my once in a lifetime opportunity to utilize a provincial program to help pay for my utilities, given the province isn't helping to get me well now do you think we could do that please okay well thank you uh thank you for coming in this evening and, and making your presentation well, can anybody assure me it'll be talked about we will we will refer the issue to our staff and staff will be in touch with you uh with respect to your concern because it seems ludicrous you know the okay. city of kitchener wouldn't even give me an accounting of my statement unless i paid 50 bucks which they generously broke to 25. come on they emptied my bank account okay Thank you, Ms. McGee, for coming in this evening. No problem. You're very welcome. Hope you all have a good night. Congratulations, dear. Have a good evening. Okay, next uh, on the agenda, uh, we, have, uh, we have Larry Gordon and the, uh, the tenders. Um, but before we go into the tenders, I'd uh, like to uh, share with everyone that uh, for Larry, this is a very special meeting. In fact, it's his uh, last council meeting after some 35 years 
um, with the uh, almost 35 years with the city of Kitchener. He started on August 11th, 1980. And Larry's uh, worked in a variety of positions. Uh, he started as our chief buyer, moved on to manager of purchasing, became director of purchasing, then purchasing officer. I'm not sure this is the right order necessarily. And then director of supply services. Um, Larry's, uh, what many of you probably don't know, is that Larry's also a Vietnam War veteran and started out with the U.S. Navy. His pride and joy is his granddaughter, Charlotte. He's looking forward to more time with friends and family at the cottage. And the other thing that most people probably don't know is that uh, uh, Larry's uh, wife is a uh, formerly Canadian Airlines, now Air Canada flight attendant. So uh, hopefully uh, he'll uh, be able to uh, enjoy uh, some of that flight benefit and uh, go around and see a little bit of the world from time to time uh, as well. So Larry, on, just before we get into your uh, final set of questions for the, uh, the, the tenders, uh, on behalf of Council, I want to thank you for your many years of service, uh, of dedicated service to the city, and uh, wish you all the best in, in your retirement. Congratulations. And so now uh, I will ask for someone to uh, move the tenders, moved by Councillor Ioannidis, seconded by Councillor Fernandez. Are there any questions? Councillor Schneider. Uh, yes, yeah, just a, a small question on the T15-021, uh, the water heaters prevention, preventative maintenance, inspection, and deliming. The, the price for residential service has increased 18% from the 2012 contract. Can you um, explain why the costs have gone up by 18%? Mr. Tayegi. Uh, so you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I think that number needs to be explained a bit more. I think uh, what is happening is on the residential side, there are two types of services being provided under the contract. Uh, one is the uh, safety inspection, uh, uh, the maintenance, preventive maintenance inspection. And the other one is uh, to remove the uh, sediments from the tanks. So on one component, uh, you, you are right. If you look at the, the contract, it would appear that uh, uh, the price compared to last year's contract is 18% over. Uh, on the other hand, though, the second part of the contract, the price is still the same. So if you blend the rates, uh, it will not come to 18%. It will come to something like 12%. And even that is, uh, or the fa fact is that uh, for three years, uh, the price was maintained under the contract. So really, that, even that 12% is not one year increase. It's an increase over the three years. And the second part to keep in mind is that the scope of the work has changed somewhat. Uh, in the new contract, we also require the, uh, uh, the company to go in and do the inspection of the pipes to make sure there are no leaks in the pipes. So that is an uh, added uh, service which was not part of the uh, previous contract. Okay, thank you. Okay. Councillor Fernandez. Um, yeah, I have a number of questions. So are, are, are we, is it your desire to go through each one separately uh, you, uh, or? Do you have questions on different ones? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, Councillor Gazzola, are you in the same boat? Okay, so I'll go through them one by one then. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Seabird Avenue Road uh, reconstruction. Any questions? Okay, so that's okay. Go ahead, Councillor Fernandez. Not a question, just um, a, a comment. Um, I know that we've been trying to work on being a little bit tighter <laughs> with our tenders, and uh, although this has got a, a large surplus, uh, I'm hoping that this will have a, a positive impact on our accelerated infrastructure program. Okay, thank you, Councillor Gazzola. Nothing on that one. Okay, next up, recycling stations. Any questions? Councillor Gazzola, go ahead. No, I was just curious as to uh, whether there was anything that could be worked out there. It appears that the larger bins, the larger bins are less expensive than the smaller ones. I just, it, it seemed odd that, uh, is there a way that, is there a way that we have an opportunity to have those people reduce the size of their bin and take advantage of, of the uh, better price? Mr. Gordon, if you can just leave your mic on, please. Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the uh, requirement for the 50-inch uh, maximum width on, or width on these units is because they're inside the facilities, and it really uh, impacts uh, the movement in the facilities if they 
if they exceed that limitation. So we had to uh, call the tender at that, that uh, maximum 50 inch and the other supplier uh, was offering a larger unit which we couldn't accept. Uh, well, I guess the question I was uh, asking is that could we not, could we have asked the other bidder to, to come up with 50 inch units as opposed to 55? Yes. His, his, his price for 55 inch units was less, so why, I, I'm confused as to why he wouldn't get the deal. I can appreciate that it has to be a, a 50 inch unit, but it doesn't make sense that uh, his 55 inch units are, are a lot less expensive. Once again, through you, Mr. Mayor, that the uh, Tender was called, and once uh, once we have received the bid from the the uh, bidders, we can't uh, go back to someone after we received other people's prices and ask them to give us a different price. Okay, I guess that's the answer I was looking for, as to uh, we're not able to do that. I'm not clear that I understand that, but that's that's what I was aiming at. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, water heat. Sorry, Council Marsh, was your question on the last one? Yes. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. So, just to clarify for the recycling stations, will we be uh, then <clears throat> adding these stations to all of the community centers? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm not certain of that. I can get that information for you. And um, uh, could you also then also find out, please? about the Victoria Park Pavilion as, as a, a yes. location because it's been brought to my attention several times that we don't have proper recycling facilities at that uh, facility. So, thank you. Next up, we have uh, water heaters. Councillor Fernandez. Uh, yes, I, I did send in a question um, to Mr. Malcolm about this because I was a little bit puzzled as to how we decide uh, who uh, gets inspected because We've rented a water heater from the city of Kitchener for the la over 25 years, and we've never had an, an inspection or even an offer for one. So it, according to Mr. Malcolm, we have 2,000 scheduled water heaters, so, uh, and that they are done um, every five years. Can you help me understand, Mr. Tiegi, how we decide who gets chosen and who doesn't? <coughs> Mr. Tiegi? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we have uh, something like... Uh, 41,000 units uh, uh, rented out uh, uh, to homeowners. And uh, in any given year, we uh, try to cover up to about 2,000 uh, units. Now, uh, the, the age of these units that we are doing uh, will be anywhere from, uh, actually four years is the lower limit. Uh, in most cases, we are dealing with the units which are more than five years old. And uh, uh, the, the, the type of uh, unit we have, uh, what we know of those units and the age are some of the factors which uh, determine as to which unit will be inspected next. So do we have a, a specific um, log of information that as somebody's water heater becomes five years old, it automatically clicks into uh, uh, the list of who can have theirs delimed? And inspected? Uh, yes, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we have information about uh, uh, each unit that we have rented out as to where they are located and uh, also the age of those units and also uh, previous inspections, if any, carried out on these units. Okay. Uh, Councillor Gazzola, you had a question on this one? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, it states in the report that in the past three years are annual purchase has been in the neighborhood of $123,000, but this year we're almost tripling that. I just, I'm, I'm curious as to why, what, what has happened as to why we're uh, tripling the purchase. Are we getting a lot more new customers or? Um, I didn't follow the question. Uh, is the purchase of the units, or you, we're talking about the uh, uh, replacement or the, the inspection? Well, it says here that the average spend for the past three years has been in the neighborhood of $123,000 per annum. Now we're looking at 320000 which means we're 
uh, we're buying three times as many units. And I'm just curious as to what, what's happened that we're... The other, while you're mulling that over in your mind too, uh, on the weekend with uh, mail that came from the city, or at, at one point there was a newspaper and it had quite a long article on the value of, of, uh, of tankless water heaters. I'm just curious as to whether we, uh, we have looked at that or we are looking at that or where that stands. That's the second question. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the two parts of the question with respect to the first part, uh, in uh, 2000, uh, uh, last, last <coughs> couple of years, our uh, numbers were around 1,000 to 1,200 units that uh, we inspected. Uh, this year, we are going to do about 2,000, as I said earlier, and the reason simply being that uh, even at this rate, uh, uh, we are looking at water heaters which uh, really are getting quite old, and uh, uh, there are some uh, safety requirements uh, 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 and that we need to inspect them and to make sure that uh, uh, these tanks do meet the uh, safety requirements. Uh, that, that's the first part of the, uh, the answer. Uh, in terms of the second part, the uh, uh, tankless uh, units uh, which are installed at each uh, uh, location, you know, for example, one could have a unit in the kitchen and separate unit for the bathroom. That is the decision uh, homeowners have to make. We uh, really, uh, I don't think uh, we would want to go into that kind of business where uh, uh, we are purchasing these small units and installing them in the, in the home. That's something which uh, homeowners may decide to do. Well, do they have that option to lease a, a tankless unit through you? I, I want to jump. you're going to move on, yes. So, no, 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 Councilor Gazzola, I, I, you're, you're onto something, then, and maybe someone else can help me, because uh, this was before Mr. Tayagi's arrival. I seem to recall that I think we did introduce them, in, in fact, in Kitchen Utilities. Mr. Chapman, can you help us? Do you, can you click in? You're not coming on. Well, it's something that doesn't need to be dealt with tonight. Well, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get you an answer. Just hang on one sec. I'm just trying to figure out why Mr. Chapman's not. Okay. Uh, there we go. Go ahead. Uh, yes, we do offer tankless water heaters as a rental option. Our experience has been the take-up is slow because the rental cost is much higher. They're a more expensive unit, and so uh, it provides a better service, and it's more water efficient, but they are more expensive on a monthly rental rate. Okay, thank you. That answers my question, yeah. I'm still not clear on the first part of the question as to why we're tripling up. Uh, uh, if you, you're saying that that uh, the state of our units are not not great, so are, are, uh, do you have a plan, therefore, to replace all the units, or what? What, what are our plans? That's, I guess it hasn't been made clear. Mr. Well, you, you worship, as I just said, we have uh, uh, we have something like uh, 41,000 units. And uh, even with uh, 2,000 units a year, uh, it's still the substantial backlog as to uh, uh, the uh, units that needs to be inspected. And we just have to make sure that uh, we are inspecting enough units so we don't fall into a situation where uh, uh, safety becomes a concern. M Mr. Gordon, you wanted to add something to that no, one? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I was just going to speak that that same issue is that they're increasing the number of inspections to catch up with a big backlog. Yeah, I guess, that, and I don't have a problem with that. I just, it begs the whole question is, do we have a problem here that we need to be looking at? Do we, we have 40,000 units? Uh, should we be, is there some kind of a program that we, we need to be looking at? Are we getting ourselves into the hole on this? Or, now that's the purpose of my question. All of a sudden, uh, the activity has, has increased um, is there a reason for it, and, you know, what is it? Thank you. Councillor Ethington. Through you, Mr. Chair, a question to Dev. Actually, probably more of an observation in line of what Councillor Fernandez just said. I think I've rented a water heater for at least 25 years. I've never had uh, it delimed by the city, as far as I know. In fact, I think I paid to have my own deliming, and I just wondered if I could get my money back. <laughs> Councillor Singh? 
Yeah, through you, Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, Mr. Mayor, just to ensure that uh, you know we we clarify this a little better than the way Councillor uh, Gazzola left his uh, last comments with the increase in this year as opposed to previous years. So this is pretty much because these water heaters don't have indefinite lifetime. They, they do mature to a point where they do need to be replaced. Uh, if something isn't done, they will create damage, uh, water uh, damage to the property. So there is a liability to the city of safety as well as, uh, I guess, property damage, correct? Hang on, Mr. Tag, if you can just leave your mic on, please. Oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you, uh, the council is absolutely correct. We, we do have the liability, and in fact, uh, uh, there have been cases where uh, uh, the tanks blew up for one simple reason, that uh, uh, these tanks have a pressure relief valve, and uh, if you have uh, uh, sediments built around that valve, that valve gets it stuck, and uh, if the pressure increases, then valve will not function to relieve the pressure. And in that case, and that is the worst case scenario, but it has happened uh, uh, where the tank could blow, blow up. So uh, uh, some homeowners uh, who know about this problem, I think uh, uh, some do. In, in, for example, I do. Uh, uh, from time to time, I'll go and check the valve to make sure that uh, uh, the valve is operating. And uh, when you lift the valve, the pressure will be released. Uh, same thing, uh, you could open up the tank in the bottom and uh, drain the water, and that will sort of drain the, some of the uh, sediments. But not every homeowner is aware of that thing. And since those uh, tanks are owned by us, so that if something happens, uh, we have a lot of liability. So these increase in, uh, in, um, increased uh, replacements are to mitigate our, our liability. It's happened to me, that's why I want to make sure I clarify that. Then. All right, great, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on then to the water meters, any questions? Roads and surface construction. Water meter, okay, you didn't click yourself on. Okay, go ahead, Councilor Gazzola. No, I'm just curious, there's a, there's a $247,000 of projected staff time without any explanation. And normally there, I understand, I think if it's over 100,000, 100, there's some kind of explanation as to what what that is, like the the award being the amount being awarded is seven hundred and forty six thousand and then there's another two hundred and forty seven thousand of staff time. I'm just <coughs> is there some explanation as to what that is or I'm on item number four. The one where we're joining up with the city of Cambridge. City, yes. Mr. Tagge. Uh, Mr. Mayor, so uh, what happens uh, currently is that we have a program in place where city staff uh, replaces the uh, old valves uh, in the system. And, uh, but we can't keep up uh, given the resources we have. So what we are trying to do is to reduce the backlog uh, we are entering into this contract. Uh, now. What's going to happen is this year and perhaps for the next uh, few years where both the contractor and our own staff will be replacing valves so that we can expedite uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the meters, uh, so that we can expedite the process and reduce that, that backlog of uh, replacing those, those uh, meters. So that's the reason why you see the staff cost as well as the uh, uh, contractor's sure. cost. Uh, uh, my thoughts are that uh, in few years' time, we should be able to reduce that backlog where we will not need outside uh, service to do this work and we'll be back to uh, simply our staff uh, uh, maintaining the system and uh, replacing those meters as needed. Uh, so, so let me get this straight. Up to now, we just bought the meters and we, we, we installed them, right? Up till now. Now we're... Now we're hiring other people to do that? Mr. Tag. Uh, up to now, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, up to now, city staff used to buy the meters and we used to uh, install them. Uh, now what we're going to do is we'll still continue to do that, but also supplement that with a contractor doing some of the work. 
Okay. Councillor Schneider, is it on this or the next issue? Okay, go ahead, Councillor Schneider. Uh, Dev, uh, I, I recall during the budget hearings, too, that there was an issue with us possibly losing revenue because of water meters that weren't uh, operating correctly. So by installing these new meters, that could also uh, help us recover that loss, potential loss revenue. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, you're absolutely correct, uh, 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 Councillor, that uh, one of the regions, actually the main region, we are replacing these meters because uh, it helps us reduce the loss in the system. And uh, we can recover the money through uh, increased uh, uh, or, or more precise reading of the meters. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll now then move on to roads and... Oh, Mr. Gordon, you want to add something to that? Go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to add one more thing. There's approximately 22,000 meters that are currently over 15 years old. So we are in need of replacing. That would be a lot. Uh, okay, Councillor Fernandez on roads and surface construction. On this, on the meter. Okay, go yeah. ahead. It's just in light of Councillor Gazzola's question, line of questioning, uh, how long are we, and I apologize if this has already been answered because I, I didn't see it. How long are we expecting to have to use uh, a consultant and a, sorry, a contractor to do this work to get rid of the backlog? Mr. Taggy. Uh, through you, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you, uh, I, I really can't give you the precise number because it will depend upon uh, at what rate we replace uh, these meters. And uh, given the amount of money we have in this year's budget, uh, I suspect the program will continue for a few years to come. Uh, one comment also I want to make is that uh, with the restructuring we are doing in utilities, uh, that will provide us with the extra capacity to do uh, more uh, meter replacements by in-house staff. And uh, when I say restructuring, it's not adding new FTEs. Within the same FTEs, we are doing uh, uh, rejuggling of the uh, resources. And uh, that should increase our capacity by 30 to 40 percent, maybe 50 percent. Okay. Uh, um, so so the, the reason I can give you precise numbers because uh, uh, depending upon at what rate we can accomplish the restructuring and at what rate the, uh, uh, the, uh, that, that in-house staff will be able to produce uh, more of this work uh, will depend upon uh, certain retirements in the department. So there are a lot of factors involved there. But eventually, as I said, our goal is to be self-sufficient and reach a point where we don't have this huge backlog, number one, and number two, uh, where we can do this work uh, by in-house staff. Okay, and I, I can appreciate that, that you're, you're in the <coughs> middle of something, a big change here, but, but is your hope, because one of the questions that Councillor Schneider asked was about um, the concern that we were losing revenue. Are you, is it your hope that as you replace these, these meters, quicker and sooner and faster that it should offset our, um, so the cost of doing all this work, which is close to a million dollars, will be offset by the revenues that we might be losing? Yeah, in, in fact, uh, there's no legislated requirement in terms of, as opposed to the previous item with the water heater, there's no legislated requirement uh, for us to replace the, the meters. We're doing it for our own benefit because uh, uh, we could uh, rec recuperate some of the cost, which is wasted because we're not capturing all the water being used on, on, the, on the property. So, so you're absolutely right, uh, Councillor, that uh, uh, some of that money will be recovered through uh, better uh, recording of the use of the water. Okay. I, and just, it's coming to mind that I know Cambridge has been struggling with a number of residents have received extor exorbitantly high water bills um, because uh, uh, meters have not been addressed or they're, whether they're old or new, I don't know. I haven't thought, tracked it that far. Is, I guess one of the concerns that I would have is if you're changing water meters, how, how, what will you use as a benchmark? Are you going to be go coming in at, when they're five years <coughs> old, 10 years old? What, what is your benchmark for replacing these? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm not quite following the question. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I, because I, I went off track. Um, 
the city of C Cambridge has been in the news quite a bit that there are a number of residents that have complained about um, very high water bills. Some of that I, could be attributed to water meters that are not um, reading properly. But I want to understand what you, your benchmark will be when you say to a resident, we're coming in to replace your water meter, and they say, well, you know, it's been working fine. We've got, you know, our usage and our, and our bill really pretty much equal what we would expect it to be. Are you going to say to somebody, well, you know, your water meter is seven years old. We well, need to replace it regardless. Well, I, I think uh, my response is going to be uh, that definitely when we replace the water meters, and especially if those water meters were uh, registering uh, very slow, uh, so my response is going to be that for the next or the previous number of years, uh, those residents got a quote-unquote free ride, if you may, and now they are being billed for the actual use of the water. So just because uh, uh, they were not billed for the, the amount used in the past is not a justification for not being billed for the uh, right use of the meters. I'm not aware of any meters that uh, with age uh, uh, speed up. Uh, my experience is that to meet us with the age, they slow down, which means they don't record, record uh, as much as they should. They record less than the amount being used. Okay, and, and I understand that, but I guess I, my, my question continues to be, what age will you say, your meter is 10 years old, we have to replace it? Or is it... Is there a benchmark that you're going to be using? So, so the question is, what is our standard? Is it to change it every 10 years, every 7 years, every 15 years? What, what are we striving for? Uh, we, we really use a, a formula based upon, uh, first of all, water uses, for example. So what I'm going to suggest is that if uh, there is a uh, property, and I think this question was raised at budget time, too, by one of the councillors, and uh, I think Councillor Davies, if I'm not correct, raised the same issue. Uh, the issue is that when we are replacing meters, we need to uh, put the money where it will provide the best benefit for us. So it's just not simply the age, but also if you look at two properties, and uh, one property is using X amount of water um, every month or every year, and the second one is using only 50% of that am amount, then I think our emphasis will be to go after the property where the water use is high. So it's just not just age alone, it's, it's the use, and also, uh, uh, not every meter of uh, the same age uh, is defective <coughs> to the same extent because obviously uh, high uses uh, meters have, even though the age may be the same, but it's like somebody driving two cars. One person drives 300,000 kilometers in the same span of time and somebody drives 50,000 kilometers. Age may be the same, but obviously because mileage is low, that car will be better safe. Similarly, water meters. Just because age is same, they really have had to work as much as the, the other meters. Okay, thank you. Okay, so next, roads and surface construction. Any questions? No ready mixed concrete. Councillor Fernandez. So I had asked a number of questions on, on this one, uh, and one of them was, what was our annual spend? And my understanding that the annual spend was 214000 and now we're being asked for um, 376000 So can, sorry, Mr. Tiegi, you seem to be on the hot seat tonight. Um, can you help me understand um, why we're increasing the spend about 160000 uh, and how we're going to accomplish that? Uh, I mean, is it existing staff? Um, are we hiring more staff? Can you help me understand where this additional money is going to come, would be used? Uh, our backlog of concrete work uh, uh, has been increasing over the years, and uh, what we are trying to do is uh, catch up to some of that backlog. Uh, so that's one of the reasons, actually that's the main reason why uh, the, uh, uh, our program is expanding in terms of how much money we're going to spend on, on, on the concrete to repair the sidewalks and curbs and uh, utility cuts and, and different things like that. Uh, in terms of uh, how we are going to do it, uh, we are going to, uh, uh, one of the part of the plan is uh, we are going to reassign some of the staff from other functions uh, to uh, address th this, this work. Uh, but secondly, also, we are hiring three 
additional temporary summer staff uh, to help out. And uh, they will be funded by utility cuts, two of them at least, and uh, one will be funded from uh, capital budget. Okay, and, and this temporary staff that we're hiring, um, this is only for a, a certain period of time? How long do we expect to have this temporary staff on? Uh, your correct your counselor, this will be only for the summer months. Uh, and again, uh, when I say summer months, uh, it all depends on the weather as well. So uh, if we are lucky and we have uh, a good construction season, uh, we may revisit that and extend the, the term, but uh, uh, depending upon the, the, uh, the, the spring and summer and fall we have, uh, will dictate as to uh, 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 how much we spend on, on, on doing this work. Okay. I, I appreciate your, um, your response, Mr. Tiagi. I think it's important for Council to understand when, when there's a big difference, like $160,000 in what I usually spend and what we are spending, that we understand what, where that money is going to be spent and how it's going to be spent. So I appreciate your response. Thank you. Okay. And the last item is tires and related services. Any questions? Okay, if not, the tenders have been moved and seconded. Let's deal with the water heaters first with the noted uh, <clears throat> conflict. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. And the remainder of the uh, tenders, all those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Mr. Uh, <clears throat> Gordon, you are uh, officially retired from council duties. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, and I'd just like to say one thing that in the 34 years that I've been here, never had a day that I woke up and wished I didn't have to come here. It's been a great place to work, and I've appreciated it. And considering you had to drive in from Listowel, that's pretty darn good. <laughs> Thank you very much, all the best. Okay, we'll uh, move back. There was uh, one delegation uh, who wasn't here uh, earlier. Um, and uh, since we're still in delegations, I, I won't require a motion to, uh, um, to hear the delegation. Um, Mr. Druitz. Welcome, sir. For councillors. Okay, if you can give them to the clerk, please. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, uh, I was watching on the webcast, and I didn't see my name on the agenda, so I wasn't sure exactly where I would be speaking. It must have been because you, you registered after the, uh, the printed agenda being uh, dealt with. So. Yeah, but I, I, would have, I thought that that would have been on, on the agenda beside the webcast no. today. Okay, go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, Councillor uh, Galloway Sealock, uh, congratulations. Okay, as uh, most of you councillors know, I did make a presentation on uh, procedural changes to promote more effective meetings back in December 2013 when this issue first came up. Last week I had the privilege to hear MP Michael Chong, Wellington Halton Hills, speak on the implications of the Reform Act, and that uh, gave me the initiative to speak tonight. And that Reform Act includes the changes in Parliament and also the Senate. In essence, this bill gives the individual MPs more power, closer to what they had at the beginning of the British parliamentary system, and less power in the hands of a very few. In the city's case, I refer to the discretionary power of the chair. I've been told that several times. In your procedural changes in December 2013, I suggest you went too far in limiting democratic debate. As I've said before, council chambers is where democracy is to take place. This is not 
a form for efficiency. I know of no other local jurisdiction within the region of Waterloo that limits the time in which counselors can ask questions to staff. The present procedure is really inefficient and actually wastes time. And let me illustrate. It is like a very short green traffic light. In order for traffic to move relatively well, one needs to decrease the number of times vehicles need to stop and start. Picture Fisher Hallman and all the lights in Fish Fisher Hallman, all the semis that go there. If the traffic lights wouldn't be reasonable, you wouldn't have the traffic flow that you have today. Same thing with the paperwork that's in front of you. Another illustration. It's like a skilled tradesperson that constantly gets shifted from one job to another before the job is complete. Every time she, he needs to open the toolbox, lay out the tools for the job ahead, and then gather the tool up, tools up and close the toolbox and go on to the next job. It's just inefficient. The same principle applies here. A counselor hardly gets started in his or her line of questioning, then they need to follow the line of questions by the other counselors, then have to go back to their notes before coming back to their questions. Time is wasted in that one needs to recall the precise point at which the previous debate was broken up and in order to move forward on the previous line of questions. In conclusion, I recommend you support this motion before you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Dewitz. Any questions for Mr. Dewitz? There don't appear to be any, so thank you very much for coming in and sharing your views with us this evening. <clears throat> we'll uh, be coming back to this uh, issue uh, under uh, new business uh, shortly. Uh, so we'll now move into the uh, the reports of uh, of committees, and we'll start with community and infra community and infrastructure services. Uh, Councillor Ioannidis. It's been moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Frank Etherington that the report of the community and infrastructure service committee be adopted through items through one to item eleven. Items 1 through 11, moved by yourself, seconded by Councillor Etherington. Uh, Councillor Fernandez. Yes, I would like to pull out um, item number 8, uh, because there, was, uh, there wasn't a unanimous vote on that, and uh, I just want to speak to it briefly. Okay, uh, that's fine. Uh, any other questions? No? Okay, go ahead then, Councillor Fernandez, and speak to item 8. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that one of the concerns that Council had was that uh, the recommendations from the report card did not line up with some uh, some budget and finance, and, and there was a concern that any recommendations would be above and beyond what our budget had been set. Uh, I didn't support Councillor Davies' uh, amendment to the motion because I felt that the... Um, the intent of the report card was really a snapshot in time with recommendations both for the municipality, for the region, and for the province. And it did not necessarily target uh, the budget. It I just identified some areas with which the, uh, the cycling report could speak to and, and uh, recommend. There was no intention by um, either the cycling committee or the subcommittee to uh, work outside of the guidelines of outside of our budget at that time. So I'd like to have a separate vote for this. That's fine. I'll deal with it separately on, on this issue, Councilor Marsh. Okay. I'll turn to you. Go ahead. Uh, just in response to uh, uh, Councilor Fernandez's uh, comments, I, I mean, I want to mention, I want to say that uh, I, I, I did support the, the amendment, and I, I, but I am also uh, pro-cycling just, uh, just as much as uh, as um, Councillor Fernandez, I this this uh, cycling uh, report card is the first 
one uh, that we received, and we we uh, we need to understand a little bit better about where we stand in terms of Ontario and in terms of uh, the the world stage. And and from from anecdotal uh, chats with the people from the cycling committee, it may turn up that we are falling short compared to other Ontario municipalities in terms of funding of cycling infrastructure. And so I see no harm in 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 being able to compare to other municipalities. I, I, I think that this um, you know, C grade that we received is, is an indicator that, yeah, we, we need to do more work, but so do some of our partners within the region, the, the, the police services and the region of Waterloo Municipality. And, uh, and so uh, this, is, this is a kick, kick start, uh, kicking it in motion, and um, it, it, it's... Uh, is something that, that we're, we're working towards, and I, I'm looking forward to, to uh, if it's going to give us a bit more impetus to, to do more, then, then I think that'll be positive. So I just want to say that. Okay. Councillor Davey. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on the implications of the budget. I'm just going to pick out one example. It was on the original report uh, in our original package on page 813. Uh, keys for Kitchener to achieve a higher grade in the evaluation and planning area include the following. The City of Kitchener should increase the number of full-time staff dedicated to cycling initiatives, planning and policy development, responsibilities City of Kitchener. That is simply one of several items in this report card that would have a significant uh, impact on, uh, on our budgeting and uh, I would, I'm especially surprised to hear that from members of Council that have so um, often in the past been concerned with adding additional FTEs. Uh, so the purpose of the amendment, in case it wasn't already clear, is that I understand that the report card is simply comparing us, and actually I thought the, the um, follow-up article and the record was, uh, or perhaps it was the Kitchener Post, has done quite well uh, with respect to indicating that this is simply a comparison of our infrastructure at this point in time compared to other municipalities and other uh, areas of the world that have been working on their infrastructure for several more years. So I wanted to be clear that it's not, we need to understand or if we're dedicating enough dollars to this or not. My sense is that we are at this point in time, but I'm not sure. That's why this motion, uh, that's why that amendment was put before us. If it turns out that we're underfunding cycling, I am more than happy to have that conversation. But until such time as we're proven, uh, that's not proven to be the case, I think it's only prudent that we don't put the cart before the horse and look at uh, expanding that budget without having that sort of context. Okay. Thank you. Um, on this again, Councillor Fernandez. I just wanted to point out what the I just want to point out what the actual recommendation from staff was that it be referred to staff for review. So I didn't I don't understand why we needed to to go any further. But um, the, I just wanted to point out that that was the original recommendation from staff. Okay. Thank you for uh, for those comments. Um, any other comments on any of the on any of the items? Just uh, two very quickly then from uh, from myself. Um, I will support the recommendation uh, that's before us. I think, uh, as many of us indicated at, at committee, um, we would have, uh, like anyone, you would have preferred to see a, a higher grade, but I think uh, on the issue of the cycling and trail uh, master plan, it is an opportunity for uh, us to reflect on what we did well last year and also to uh, reflect on how we can do better next year and in the years going forward. And so uh, I look forward to uh, uh, seeing the next report come out in, in 2016. And, uh, and then finally, the only other issue uh, is um, I'm pleased to see the neighborhood strategy um, moving forward. I think this is uh, something that really addresses a number of issues in our, in our community, uh, from planning issues to community development issues and, and more. And I'm, see, I'm happy to see that move forward. So with that, uh, Councillor Etherington, you had a comment on something? No, I support you on that one, uh, Mayor Vabanovich. I just wondered on number 10, something that gets to me. I wasn't here for this meeting, but on number two in item 10, it says creating a framework to facilitate and support a citizen-led approach to placemaking in the city's neighborhoods. What does that mean? Can someone tell me? I uh, will let Mr. May tell you what his words meant. Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd certainly be happy to sit down and talk at great length about this strategy with Councillor Etherington. Having said that, uh, what, uh, what I spoke to committee about 
uh, was uh, starting to create neighborhood action plans, which are actual documents uh, led by citizens, by neighbors, supported by city staff and by ward councillors to identify priorities for how the neighbors would like to see their neighborhoods strengthened and improved. And I understand that. Thank you very much. I didn't understand the word place make. Okay, so we've been asked to deal with number eight first. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? That. What do you mean two? So you're just asking, you want it dealt, you want it separated as well? As? Okay. That's fine. You didn't, uh, I just understood that you were looking for number eight. Okay, so we'll uh, deal with number eight, the first clause. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously. And the second clause, all those in favor? Opposed? One opposed. That two is carried. The balance of the report? All those in favor? Opposed? That two is carried. We've dealt with, uh, with Heritage Kitchener. We'll now then move on to uh, unfinished business. No unfinished business. And then we'll move on to new business. Councillor Fernandez, you provided notice of motion. You yes, want? I have. Um, in, in the last Sorry, number... I, I should, uh, so you're moving it. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Netsky. Okay, go ahead now. <laughs> Thank you. In the, the last number of months, we've had... Uh, a, a bit of a, a challenge trying to get questions done within the five minute time frame. It's resulted in um, some behavior within the, the council chambers that probably was not uh, as respectful as it should be. And I think what's, what's critical to understand, and as our delegation pointed out, um, that it, it becomes very inefficient. Um, five minutes worth of questioning uh, with respect, being respectful to staff with, with their ability to respond properly or to delegations to respond properly, it, it, it takes often much longer than five minutes for, those for that question and answer to happen. To go around again another five minutes and then after those five minutes to not be allowed to ask any further questions does not move forward on the agenda items and it doesn't move forward on making sure that, that our citizens who are watching us, either on Roger or live streaming, um, that any uh, citizens who are sitting here and any council members who may have a question, that it doesn't move the, the, the work of the corporation forward. So I'm making the request and I'll um, read out the motion if that's what you would like me to do. Mr. Mayor. Sorry, which? Read out the motion if you would like me to do so. Uh, no, well, it's in, in front of everyone, I think. Okay, so, it, well, I, I guess essentially it's asking that each member of council be allocated a total of 10 minutes for their initial set of questions, which include the amount of time it takes to response and delegation with a, a, a secondary opportunity for another 10 minutes. My hope is that um, council will support this in the interest of moving the work forward and finding things to be a bit more respectful and expedient. Okay, Councillor Netsky. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, uh, I uh, would agree with the recommendation of this motion suggested by Councillor Fernandez and, uh, and her comments. I just also want to add that uh, what becomes the challenge for, for us councillors is that within a five minute period, you do ask the question of staff or of the delegation and depending on the staff person or the delegation and the nature of the question, sometimes it's a long-winded answer that you may only get one or two questions in because your question could be 30 seconds, but the answer could itself be four and a half minutes. And then there goes your time. And then you've got to wait for your next round. So it, it, you know, it would help if, if the responses were maybe shorter or maybe to the point, but sometimes I know you need to go into details because the explanation is such that you need to. But it's that type of rationale, that type of problem that causes the five minute limit to be the problem itself. And you'd want to go in and maybe ask a second or third question, and then, you're, and then you have to be uh, uh, cut off or stopped, and then you've got to wait for your round to come back. And depending on, the, with, the, with 10 counselors uh, around, everybody gets five minutes. Assuming you take the worst case scenario, it could be 50 minutes before it comes back to you. So uh, I think to have that opportunity to, to say your questions right up front is, uh, is very important. So I'm prepared to support this uh, motion. Okay. Councillor Ioannidis? Yes, through you, Mayor. 
Rabanovich. Um, I'm wondering if it's be prudent if we could just uh, maybe refer this to a, a later date. And my rationale with that is, I think uh, I think some of the rules, the rules that were impl implement, implemented about a year ago, was to prevent members of councils abusing the system, in particular racing to the button. And to me, that is not a democratic process, racing to the button. In fact, when, when someone is racing to the button, it kind of deflates the other members of council who may want to have questions. So whoever races to the button and gets their 10 minutes to talk may, may in fact, delay a certain individual from another member of council from saying certain questions because of because of whatever, those questions may have been asked. So I think, I think to take away from the race to the button, we, we implemented this strategy. So what I think is I think we should come back, have staff come back with a report, a one-year report, and whether or not to see whether we had some, any form of efficiency. Okay. I think that would be the prudent way. Um, I will... A motion to referral does to refer does take precedence, but I'll come back to you. I'll ask you to hold that so I can hear from other members of council. First, Councillor Gazzola. Actually, I was absent for the first part of that meeting last year when you dealt with this. I didn't. I, I don't quite understand why we went that road. I didn't uh, hear about this race to the button issue. I didn't. I don't know what that's all about. Well, you, you, at, 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 no, at any rate, uh, if we proceed with this, I am, uh, I'm in support of it. I don't think the, the recommendation goes far enough. Uh, I, I would like to do away with this, this whole time limit. I want to be, uh, I really want to emphasize the one part of, of the recommendation that's coming forward, and that's to give delegations 10 minutes. Right now, we give them five. I think most of the other if we compare it to the other uh, councils in our region and the region itself, they give people 10 minutes. And I think that's the least we should be moving to. We had two occasions, at least two occasions tonight, if not three, where delegates were speaking and all of a sudden the bell goes and they're wondering who called their bell and what it's all about. You know, the, the least we should do is, is approve that part of it and I would like to see that approved right away where, where delegates are, are, are allotted 10 minutes. On the other, I, I, don't, I don't like uh, where we've gone from being able to ask all our questions all at once when our, thought, our train of thought is moving along a certain line to get everything done. The way it operates now, you get a third of the way through your questions and whatnot, and it's, it's time up, sit down, go sit in the corner till it's your ch chance again. I, I really don't understand how it has improved anything. I don't know that, I don't know what we needed to improve on, uh, to ask better questions. I think it's, uh, that's part of the democratic process is to put all the questions on the table. We shouldn't ever try to limit that. Uh, yes, some people can are better speakers than others, and some people can pose their questions better than others. Some people can write better than others, but I don't think that should be uh, the test here. We we should go through the process where we're allowed to ask all the questions that we have and put all the issues on the table. I I've sat around here for many many years, and I don't know that uh, any, I've never really heard from members of council about how much time they spend around the horseshoe. So I, I quite frankly, I was gonna bring in a, an amendment to, to go back to where we were with the one exception of allowing uh, public delegates to have 10 minutes, but I will go along with a 10 minute that's better than where we're at now. Just as, as a reminder for all members of council that the uh, original report was something that council had requested staff to develop on the issue of um, our meetings, the length of meetings, meeting efficiency, and ask staff to look at best practices and come forward with a series of recommendations. They did, and the previous council uh, actually amended those recommendations, added extra time for questions, 
and that's how we ended up here today based on a vote of council so just so that uh, everyone is familiar with that and that was about a year ago councillor Ethington, you're next yeah through you mr chair <coughs> excuse me i would support any type of review uh, i have no problem with that and put possibly an increase in time for delegates speaking to council but as far as the five minutes for council questions, I'm perfectly content with that. I think it's adequate. That current practice works, I believe. I think five minutes with the opportunity to buzz back in is, is okay. It, in, it also encourages councillors to exercise a little verbal self-discipline and restraint. And I really do think there's a need for that. I think we need more of that restraint to ensure that we make certain there's adequate time for Joe Public to get in there and speak instead of councillors. So for that reason, I support the current procedure to maintain five minutes. And in the kindest, considerate and respectful way, I mean, I know I use strong language sometimes, I regret the fact that occasional verbal diarrhea from a minority of councillors often dominates and prolongs these meetings. Even the five-minute rule, thanks to some councillors, has done little to result in more efficient meetings. And I don't think we need to add to an unhealthy situation where a few councillors hijack our meetings. Councillor Davey. Thank you. Um, one question of staff, if I could. With I don't want to dig up too deep into the, the, the previous report, um, but could staff comment on uh, the findings of the length of the meetings for Kitchener Council? Granted, we have two new members, but uh, the previous Kitchener Council with respect to how we compared to other municipalities. Mr. Goody. Through you, Mayor Verbanovic. Um, as outlined in the previous report, uh, it was indicating that a uh, number of councils in the area uh, were averaging approximately two and a half hours for their council meetings, and our council meetings were running at approximately four hours and four minutes in their time. Um, and looking at our current numbers, we are somewhat uh, better right now, where we're about three hours, 50 minutes for our council meeting, approximately. Thank you. Uh, and you're taking comments as well then? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I don't, th seeing as we just went through this process uh, in 2013, I think, honestly, I think staff has enough on their plate without having to worry about, about this again. So I, I don't think I'm really going to support a review and I, I'm certainly not going to support uh, this motion. Uh, I would, um, well, f a few comments. First of all, I agree that, uh, um, that delegations could, in some circumstances, have a longer opportunity to speak, especially at public input sessions. Um, granted that council, of course, uh, speak less. When it's time for delegations to speak, we should hear from them. So at public input, I'd be more than willing to look at a 10 minutes per delegation provided council uh, just listened. Uh, the other part of that, though, within the five minutes, uh, you should really be able to get your point across in five minutes. But the real key part of that is after a delegation speaks for five minutes, there could be another half an hour, 40 minutes, an hour of questions of that delegation. We've seen that happen in the past. So if there are questions that councillors have, that delegation could be up there for quite a period of time. Um, so I'm not really sure that that's, that's something we need to have on a regular basis. I do agree that this is about democracy. And there are people, one of the reasons I love Robert's Rules is there are people like myself that are definitely not uh, type A personalities. Uh, I don't like dominating the discussion, but that's why it has to be equitable. I don't want to uh, race to the buzz, race to the button, as Councillor Ioannidis indicated. And basically, what he meant by that is, uh, if there's an issue that people want to speak on, they will play like the Jeopardy version of "I want to click in first so I can speak about it for the first 10 minutes," and that really lessens the engagement for the rest of Council and their opportunity to get their questions. And it also lessens democracy in the case that if two people take two, if two people take their 10 minutes each, or three people take their 10 minutes each. We're a half an hour in, and there are members of council that are going to be reluctant to even speak if we're way behind schedule, and that also hurts democracy. So 
uh, I, I won't be supporting this. I think we really just need to be more succinct. We need to go back to asking staff offline questions that aren't absolutely critical. <coughs> Councillor Schneider. Yes, I would just uh, also like to point out that you know, being a new councillor and, and learning the ropes, that questions don't all need to be asked here in the chambers. We can set up an appointment with staff members. We can visit one on one. We can phone. We can email. And if there's something that comes up in those conversations that we want here in the public chambers, we can inform them of a question that we're going to ask. That lets them to prepare a succinct answer. I, I, I have observed that sometimes when we're questioning, there's quite a bit of preamble and opinion making before the question is asked. If we simply edit, prepare, have our questions written down, uh, let staff know, maybe in general terms, what we want to ask. Uh, it's going to let them prepare better and they won't have to scramble for an answer. So I think there's ways that we can uh, improve our efficiency without having to increase the time that we're given to speak. I think uh, a 10-minute limit, it, it, as Councillor Davies said, will uh, cause others not to want to respond and things may be uh, you know, said that, that, you ought, that you want to say by somebody else. So it, I think the five minute gives everybody uh, a good chance that we have a total of 10 minutes to ask questions. And I think it's, it's on us to be as efficient as possible, prepare ourselves and help prepare staff as much as possible as well. Councillor Marsh. I won't take much time, uh, but I just, I, I want to echo uh, Councillor Davey and Councillor Schneider's comments. Uh, I would also, when it comes time to vote, I would like to sep uh, vote separately on the last uh, <clears throat> amendment to Chapter 25 regarding the delegations, uh, because I, I do think uh, that uh, we should provide delegates with, uh, with a maximum of 10 minutes, and perhaps even to add a caveat that, you know, to provide delegates with delegations with a suggested five minutes to a maximum of 10 minutes so that it's clear that we expect five minute presentations but if they need a bit more time that we can uh, provide it to them in the interest of, of getting the full uh, presentation from them, f full ideas. Councillor Singh. Yeah, thank you Mr. Uh, Mayor. I think the delegation um, earlier said this that council is not a place for efficiency, it's a place for democracy. But I think that is the exactly thing that's happening with the changes to our, um, our policy. Uh, it's not about efficiency, it's about fairness. Uh, I won't repeat what others have already said, but the aspect of allowing everyone to have an equal share of asking questions, being able to represent their constituents uh, is a form of democracy. And some of us don't or aren't inclined to ask and repeat the same thing <coughs> that was said by our colleagues. And if someone has ample time to go through all the list of questions that could possibly be asked, that's exactly what was happening before. So I think this is better. This is be improved democracy, and our constituents are getting a better discussion and dialogue out of this because it's allowing more of us to, to enter into the dialogue and, uh, and provide a perspective. And it's not just the five minutes. It's five minutes first time, five minutes second time opportunity and then additional five minutes of comments. It's ample time. And then it's on top, I would like to add, everything that happens in council, a lot of that discussion happens through committee as well. There's a lot of process of discussion and dialogue that leads up to before a decision is made. Councilor Fernandez. Yep, just to wrap up, I checked with um, our counterparts in the area. The region um, allows two questions at a time with no time limit, and then another two, round of two questions if they wish. City of Cambridge has no limit, and Waterloo has no time limit. So if democracy is not happening in those cities, um, I feel sorry for the citizens in those cities because, gosh, that means that somebody can talk unlimited. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me that um, the chairs of the committees are saying that they don't want to uh, get, extend a longer question time for uh, any of council because they want to keep the control within their jurisdiction. So um, I would like to ask for a recorded vote. I think it's important that the public note that... Uh, no. 
Let the public note that we are, um, you know, we're, we're limiting the amount of questions that council is allowed to ask. I always ask questions offline, but I think it's really important for some questions to be publicly asked so the public knows what we're asking. Okay, Councillor Galloway Sealock, you haven't speak, spoken yet, and then uh, yeah, I see I, a couple I, other people going a second time. I'd ask people to uh, try to limit their comments, but Councillor Galloway Sealock. Try and get this out before he starts screaming. Um, I, I think that one last comment, one of those comments, was unfair. Uh, the, you've you've heard Councillor Fernandez around the horseshoe. There's support for keeping uh, to the five-minute time frame, not just from the committee chairs. And I think that that was something that uh, you know isn't going to contribute to the respect that you were re referencing around the chambers. So I do want to to acknowledge that. I think we're here because we had a we had an issue, and we still have that issue, and that issue came forward in a report where staff tried to outline how we can be more effective and efficient in our meetings. And if we remember that meeting, I think we allotted an hour to that meeting, and it took us four hours to get through that one item, I believe, to talk about how to be more efficient and effective. And that was the, mocker, the mockery that came out in the media the next day, was that we talked about being effective and efficient in our meetings, and it took us four hours to do it. We need to, I, I agree with many of the comments that have been said, we need to come prepared. We need to not ask questions that are already in the report. We need to be focused. We need to remember what our role is as governance of the corporation. And if we stick to that focus and that lens, I think we'll see that some of our questions can be left behind or can be asked offline. And I know that there's members of council who do that already, and, that, and, and that's great. I think there is the odd occasion where a member of council, and I'm talking odd occasion, where a member of council may need a little bit longer, and I think the chairs would use the discretion at that time to do that, whether it's a ward-specific issue or just a really hot topic. I think we can all agree that we can look at, at those um, and, and proceed with them um, as, as they come up. So I think um, we need to continue on this basis because even with the new rules, we're not, we're not necessarily being more efficient. But we are having, um, we're having a lot of questions that probably don't need to be asked. Um, and so I think that we really do need to put that lens and that focus on what we're doing um, moving forward. Okay, Councillor I, Councillor Singh. Yeah, well, you know, I just want to raise my exception to uh, Councillor Fernandez's last comment uh, towards the chairs. I think uh, it's perpetuating uh, absolutely unfair uh, reality and just wanted to raise that point. Okay, if I can make uh, my comments then. Um, I, I'm glad that we're having this, uh, this conversation this evening on this issue and, and that uh, everyone's had an opportunity to express, express their viewpoints um, on the issue. Um, if, if council or the, the former uh, council members will recall when we originally dealt with this issue as a council, we gave direction to staff around certain principles and so on that we wanted looked at in terms of the, uh, the report. And sta staff came back with a series of recommendations around, based on uh, an independent, unbiased report. And I don't think anyone's going to question the, the integrity of our city clerk's department. They came back with an unbiased report with their recommendations around uh, how we sh can be more efficient and effective as a council. Uh, if I recall at the time, the, when it came to questions of counsel, I think the recommendation was that either um, we be allowed to ask one or two questions at a time, go around the horseshoe, and then go around a second time, and so on. <clears throat> there was some feeling that that uh, was not appropriate, and the standard that uh, counsel ended up using was one that applies both provincially and federally at Queen's Park and, uh, and in Ottawa at committees where members typically are given... Uh, five minutes, sometimes less, as they go around to the various uh, committee members around the committee, ask questions, and if time's uh, allowed, they, they go back a second time, depending on the overall amount of time for a committee meeting. Uh, I think if we take that into consideration in terms of the city of Kitchener, what that means, and, and acknowledge this is sort of a worst-case scenario, it means that we would potentially, on a given issue, have an hour and 50 minutes of questions if, if everybody took their five minutes twice on every single issue on an agenda. 
The proposed motion would take us to three hours and 40 minutes, worst case scenario, on every single issue on, on the agenda. Um, so I think folks need to consider that as, as they look at this issue. Um, secondly, on, on the, the proposal that's uh, before us, I, I too tend to agree that under certain circumstances it would be appropriate to give delegations uh, 10 minutes of time. If you look at the municipalities that do have a 10 minute uh, requirement, it's set up in a way where there are, there, there are different amounts of time depending on how soon uh, or wet, how, how far in advance uh, you register as a delegation. And, uh, and the closer you come to the day, the amount of time goes down and the ability to get uh, uh, questions asked and so on uh, goes down. Again, this varies community to community. I personally would prefer to see this issue um, referred to staff so that it, is, it has been in place, the, the new uh, guidelines for a year, and it would give staff an opportunity to take a look at it in, in the context of the, the, uh, the priorities we set in the first report, what's been achieved, what isn't, and come back with any uh, suggested recommendation. It keeps it independent. Council at the end of the day will do what they will do when that report comes back. Um, however, if, if that's not the will of council in terms of uh, referring it, uh, I would not be inclined to support the, uh, the 10 minutes uh, per councillor for many of the reasons that have been outlined. Um, but I could support uh, 10 minutes for uh, delegations under certain circumstances and would suggest that, that at the very least that issue then be referred back to staff to come back with some recommendations that would uh, look at, uh, you know, again, best practices uh, from other municipalities in the region and, and elsewhere in Ontario. So, uh, Councillor Ioannidis, you indicated you wanted to refer it. I, I'll need a seconder. If somebody wants to second Councillor Ioannidis' uh, motion, seconded by Councillor Singh. Councillor Davey. Thank you. I just wanted to ask that. So, this you're taking this whole motion as I'm, referral? I'm taking the whole motion as a referral first. Okay. That's could, what's been moved. Referral to staff. Okay. Could you just, could we vote on the uh, delegation part of the referral to staff separately? Okay. Thank you. So, I'll deal with the two separate referral motions. So, um, recorded vote has been called. So, we'll deal with um, referring. Um, in, in, in the context of your referral, Councillor Ioannidis, is to go back and look at it in, in terms of the original report and bring back recommendations? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Gazzola, are you looking to make a comment? I have a question to ask. Yes. Uh, if you're going to vote, we're going to go to a referral. So we're de referral takes yeah. precedent, precedent, so and we'll I, deal with... And I can't talk about the referral, I can only talk about the dates. Yes. Then so I, what's then your then timing on the referral? Okay, Councillor Ioannidis, what's your timing on the referral? When I, what, my timing on the referral is whether or not it's up to the clerk on whether that whether they can bring up that report and whatever items that they can bring to maybe tweak it. So it, I, I, laid, I leave it in their hands. Ms. Ms. Tarling or Mr. Goody, what, uh, what would be a reasonable time frame to uh, bring that report back? Well, oh, hold on, you're not on. Sorry. You, you can turn yourself on. There you go. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm not entirely certain, and maybe Colin knows, but I'm not entirely certain what we're being asked to refer at this point because we've talked about two different referrals. So I want to be clear about what it is that you're wanting from us before I can comment on timing. So I think what's, uh, depending on what gets referred, is one is the, uh, the issue of uh, the 10 minute question period. The second one will be the issue of um, amount of time for delegations to speak. So essentially what's being uh, referred is, is those two notions separately and staff to look at them in the context of the original report that you did for us a year ago, how we've either succeeded or not succeeded in achieving the goals of that original report and any new recommendations that you'd like to bring forward to committee. So uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, as Councillor Davey did allude to earlier, um, we do have other projects that are on our work plan at this point in time. So with that in mind, um, I think we'd probably be looking at probably end of May. So we'd be looking at uh, June the 15th. Okay, so the last meeting sort of before... Uh, before the break. Before the break. Okay, so that's in, in your motion? That's fine. With okay, me. so uh, that's the timing. Did you have any comment on that, Councillor Gazzola? No, I had a comment on the need to refer. 
Okay, well, that's, that's fine. We're just talking about timing now. Okay, sorry? Okay. So it's the second last meeting, Councillor Galloway Sealock. Did you have a comment on timing? Okay, if it's the second okay. last one, that's fine. Okay. It's the last, last committee, committee meeting, so I, we, I'm just raising the, the issue that usually that meeting has a lot on its agenda. Um, and this is probably something we're going to talk about extensively again. Um, so I, that's just my caution I throw out there, but I leave Perfect. it in, in whoever's hands wants to juggle those agendas. Mr. Goody, did you want to comment on that? Through Mayor Verbanovic, um, perhaps August 10th would be a more preferable date. Uh, that would also give us more time to study the issue and, uh, and report back. Okay, so uh, are you comfortable with that? Again, like I said, I, I leave it in their hand. Their okay, hands. well, there needs to be a date, so we'll use August 10th then. Okay, so we'll deal with referral of the first two parts of uh, Councillor Fernandez's uh, motion with respect to the 10 minute period, uh, referring that, and a recorded vote has been called. So a recorded vote on referral of the first two parts of Councillor Fernandez's uh, motion, particularly with respect to the 10 minutes uh, for, for councillors to uh, ask questions. And uh, so if you want it referred to staff to bring a report back, then vote yes. And if you don't want it referred, then vote no. All those in favor? Opposed? And that part is referred. And then we'll deal with the second part, which is the part with respect to delegations. We're dealing with it separately, yeah, for referral. Yeah, so all those in favor of referral, vote yes. Opposed to referral, vote no. Referral to August 10th for the part about additional time for delegations. Has everyone voted? All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. So both items will be referred and will come back on August the 10th. Okay, <clears throat> moving on uh, then to uh, any questions and answers? Councillor Fernandez? Yes, um, it came to my attention um, as having the Conestoga College uh, in my ward that for many years that the students have not been privy to the U-Pass um, City of Cambridge, which now has a campus in their city, sent, put forward through their Economic uh, Development Advisory Committee a motion um, that states the Council accept the recommendation of the Economic Development Advisory Committee, sent correspondence to the Regional Council to initiate the process to offer Conestoga College students the same rate as university students for the Grand River Transit Passes as outlined in their report. Um, I handed that to, I apologize, I do have a copy for, for the clerk. I handed that out to council just so that they could see what that report was and um, I think that I would like to know if we are able to do the same. I have sent an email to uh, Mr. Regeer since he heads up the um, Economic Development Advisory Committee. I think it's time that the Conestoga College students were treated in the same way as the university students are treated across the region. So my question is really to staff if it's something that we can look into. I, uh, Mr. Wilmer? I would suggest it is something we can look into. Uh, we would look for a resolution of council. If, if council wants to refer this to EDAC, then EDAC would know that's something that council is interested in. Okay, I, think, can, I so. think that it would be good to refer it um, formally to, to EDAC, but um, I think um, barring, I know that they are meeting at the college um, this week, 
And so I think it's a great segue for them to include that into their discussion, as Mr. Greer had suggested to me. So if we can, uh, if I can pass a resolution, put forward a resolution to council. We can, uh, yeah, we can uh, certainly uh, re refer it. I think the one uh, comment I'll, I'll make, and I'll, uh, as uh, the rep on regional council, I'll also uh, raise the issue at, uh, at committee. I seem to recall, though, I'll say, Councillor Fernandez, that I think part of the issue here, um, as I recall back a few years ago, was I think it went to a vote of the Conestoga students, because it's either an all or, or nothing. And I think Conestoga students, I seem to recall, didn't vote for it while the Waterloo and Laurier ones did, but I'm not 100% sure on that. That could be possible, but we have now got significantly upwards of 1,700 international students who depend on transit to get um, throughout the region. Um, that, that is up dramatically um, in the last, in, since I became, sat on council in 2010. So in the last five years, it's, it's almost um, quadrupled. So I think we need to recognize that, that um, that segment of the population of students really could, are dependent on transit. Okay, so I, Mr. Wilmer, I will ask one thing because I mean this issue wasn't on the agenda and there isn't a notice of a motion. Is this really, I mean, this, this isn't a big body of work. I mean, it's simply trying to get information from the region. Can we not just give this as direction to staff? Certainly, if that's council's preference, that works as well. I think we can just deal with this as direction to staff so we don't have to deal with notice of motion. Okay, I, I appreciate that. And it's only because it came to my attention um, March, you see the date is March 24th. I didn't really have time to do a, a notice of motion. Yeah, so. that's, that's fine. Okay. Um, I have one other okay, question. Okay, go ahead. Oh. On this issue? This yeah, go ahead, Councillor Gazzola. Okay. Yeah, no. I'm just curious. I've wondered for years why. Conestoga College wasn't treated the same as the two universities. Uh, when, when the city of Cambridge passed their resolution, normally when a local municipality passes a resolution like that, they circulate it to all of the other municipalities to sort of ask for their support uh, on that resolution. Was that done? I, I'm, I'm just trying to save DAC committee from, uh, from extra yeah. work. That's and I, I don't recall us ever receiving this from uh, from Cambridge, so that's up to them if they direct their staff to circulate it. So, but I don't recall us receiving. But one. it's a decision we could make quite easily without doing a lot of research on it. I would think. Yeah, no, for sure. And and again, and like I say, I, I, as I recall, there is some history there. But I may be wrong on that. But I seem to think there's some history there around uh, because it requires a vote of the student body because it's everybody or, or nobody. But I can't imagine any student body voting against getting a reduced price. No, 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 no. Because no, no. The, the the issue is everybody has to agree to have it added to their student fees, yeah. or or not. And so, if they don't vote in favor of it, then it doesn't happen. And and I seem to recall that at Laurie and Waterloo there was a vote, and they did. And I think at Conestoga they didn't. But we can check on that and report back at the next council under questions and answers. And CSI is strongly supporting us doing yep. this as well. Yep. Okay. Point taken. Another issue, okay. Councillor Fernandez. Uh, yes. Um, in, uh, in discussion with um, the Environmental Committee um, last week, one of the things that we talked about was our solar roof. We've got a number of issues on our work plan and, uh, and some discussions. And one of the questions that was asked was, uh, you know, how is, our, uh, how is our solar roof doing? What's our, what's our output? Um, what are we, um, sorry, just what kind of agreement? Do we have a maintenance agreement? Um, how long is that maintenance agreement? Um, and if we don't have one, uh, what is our exposure? Um, because we're, we're looking at, uh, from the environmental committee's perspective, we're looking at a, a lot of different ways of trying to promote solar roofs and green roofs uh, on as many buildings as we possibly can, both, both private and, and public. So I thought it was an interesting uh, discussion and, and conversation I had with some of the committee members. So I'd really like to... Um, Maybe it's a question of staff, if we can maybe have a, a, a report, an understanding, uh, a, a little bit, of, and it would be probably good for our new members of council to understand how we got the solar roof, what, what the output is, what our maintenance agreement is, all of these, uh, all of these questions. Would you prefer I sent this in an email, or I just wanted to raise it publicly. I think the solar roof is such a wonderful example of what we have done uh, an initiative that's outstanding for our city. So you're asking just for a brief update report on, on the solar roof? 
Yeah, I think, it, I think it probably requires more than just an update because um, one of the members was asking about um, maintenance. How do we maintain our solar roof? Do, and and um, if we don't uh, do that, what is our exposure? Because there are certain principles and um, properties that have to be taken care of. So it probably is more than just an update. It's probably more about the whole component, maintenance. Um, Mr. Tayagi, again, I think we need, we need to be conscious that, I mean, our, our role as council is to focus on policies, not on day-to-day -day operations and, and, and maintenance. So, um, but I think an update would be in order, but I wouldn't want to see us straying too much into, into operational detail. Mr. Tayagi? To you, Mr. Mayor, I think if the council will send me an email, uh, I'll be happy to reply to that email. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions and answers? Okay, if not, then we'll uh, move on to uh, first reading of the bylaws. Are there any late starters, Madam Clerk? There are two late starter items, uh, one regarding street vendors from CIS number four, and uh, a bylaw relating to zone change for Louisa Street, CIS item number five. Okay, and the bylaws have been moved by Councillor Singh, seconded by Councillor Gazzola, that leave be given the mover and secretary to introduce the bylaws listed on the agenda, uh, and that the same be taken as read a first time and stand referred to the committee of the whole. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Councillor Yanetsky, um, do you want to come here to do it? or? You're fine there, okay, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I need a mover for the second vote motion of the uh, reading of the bylaws. Councillor uh, Fernandez, all those in favor? Opposed, thank you. Um, committee of the whole report. Item number two, we have dealt with all the tenders number, of number one, so we'll go to item number two, dealing with the appointment for the Aeronautics Noise Management Committee. Uh, Do we have a mover? Uh, Councillor Singh? That's right. I think uh, Councillor Gazzola wants to sp has a question for okay. you. Okay. Councillor Gazzola? I would like to ask that this item be deferred to the next meeting of Council. Uh, what I'm understanding here is that there are no, there's uh, a member that was appointed is not uh, prepared to take the appointment and we need a new appointment. We need a new appointee and we haven't been able to find it. And uh, so I, I would like to, I, I know this is an issue that affects a lot of people in wards two and three specifically, and there are a lot of people that uh, have spoken concerning this issue. I just like to have a, this deferred for, for a couple of weeks to see, I would like to see a, a, a representative from the neighborhoods uh, beyond the committee. Uh, as well. And if not, and if that doesn't happen, <laughs> I'm the alternative. I not, but I, so because I'm in Ward two, uh, Three, Councillor Schneider is a member on the committee. I'm just there as an alternative. I don't get to vote if uh, if we don't get a member of the public coming forward. I would like to be able to get to be able to have a vote on the committee. Okay, appreciate the appreciate all that. Appreciate so the, the question. The first thing I'd like it to deferred for for two weeks. Okay, uh, with that it's suggestion of deferral, uh, my question to you is, uh, how would you want that addressed? But Councillor uh, Schneider to, to look for, or staff to try to address I just you? want the issue deferred to see, I, I think, uh, I would like to uh, see if I cannot encourage some people to participate as volunteers on the committee. Uh, you have uh, another member of council that has a question, Councillor Yancey. Councillor Singh? Yes, Councillor Singh. So that was a question that you were trying to ask, Councillor Yanetsky. Would the public be allowed to apply? Is, is, because that's already gone through, the process already happened. I, I gather the public has had an opportunity to apply and they haven't, but I'm just curious, wondering if the public didn't know about it. Or, yeah, no, or my question is, does the procedure then allow again to advertise and have the public apply again? So the second time around, we did advertise using social media, the internet, and we did go to the neighborhood associations within those wards. And we did not have anybody who wanted to step forward. So if through uh, shoulder tapping or through outreach, 
uh, Councillor Gazzola was able to find somebody, then that person's application would come forward here to Council and then Council would decide whether or not you wanted to appoint that individual. That's all I asked for, yeah. Um, Councillor Neski, Councillor Davey has a question as well. Sure, go ahead. Thank, thank you, just uh, in the interest of not having to worry about this coming back, I'm just wondering if it might be more appropriate if we could just pass a motion. I mean, I'd be happy to move that Councillor Gazzola be the second person if, he's un, if, if we're unsuccessful in finding someone in the next two week period that he automatically becomes that, uh, that council representative. I'm just wondering if we could take it all at once so we don't have to worry about dealing with it at a later point if we can't find someone. Is that, I guess I'm council, asking you, Councillor Yuneski, if that's, or well, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm clerk. I, I, pre I appreciate the question. I don't know if Ms. Councillor Gazzola has a comment to that to be. No comment. So I'd ask the clerks then, can we, or the clerk, can we ask, can we pass a motion contingent on if we don't find someone that he automatically becomes the representative on that committee? Okay, I would, I would make that motion then. Okay. I have a. So you're, 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 you're amending Councillor Gazzola's motion. Just that, sorry? Pardon me, I'll just provide that as an alternative to Councillor Gazzola if he wants to withdraw his deferral. If you just take this motion in place. That's fine. It, yeah. it will accomplish what I would like to see accomplished. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. If so I can just ask a question, Councillor sure. Yunetsky, then, uh, of staff. Did, were there other people that applied the first time around? And we, did we go back to those people to see if anybody wanted it? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we did go back to the original set of applications. We didn't have anyone um, other than the gentleman that was appointed. The one other applicant had been appointed to property standards, and he resigned from that position as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Netsky, Councillor Marsh has a question as well. Go ahead. Just to clarify, if we appoint... Uh, Councillor Gazzola, <clears throat> a failing finding another person, aren't there still two vacant positions that we could appoint people uh, should we get more volunteers as we go? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes. If, if it should happen that we did have some citizens come forward who did want to be representatives for City of Kitchener, we do have the option of still appointing those individuals. The city has four reps and it's the city's or council's discretion as to whether or not how that split is between citizens, re citizen reps and elected official reps. I would really like to see more citizen reps and I know that there were so many people who, who didn't get appointed in the, uh, when we were appoint making appointments and I think it's, 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 it will, won't be well, I, I don't understand why we have had a hard time finding people, but yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll leave it at that. So, uh, as I was seeing before us, we have Councillor Davies' uh, motion, uh, which basically is, is to um, uh, have clerks follow up with a, a, go through an outreach program, and if there's failing that, Councillor Gazzola becomes the alternative. Everybody understand the question? Actually, through you, Mr. Chair, my understanding is is that Councillor Gazzola will reach out into the community, or anyone can, yes, of course, but not necessarily clerk staff, but failing, filing, finding someone to be the citizen rep, then yes, Councillor Gazzola will, as the alternate, be the elected official rep along with Councillor Schneider. Well, based on that motion, is two weeks adequate? To, to the next council meeting, is that when it is in two weeks? Actually, that's a good point. I have to go and move it forward. Because yeah. you've got to get it on the agenda and all that stuff. It may not be, you only have two days to do it or something. So make that, um, when's the next meeting? I think there's a three week gap before the next meeting, Madam Clerk. Uh, April 13th is the next uh, council meeting. April 20th is next standing committee. Okay, hold on, Councillor Gazzola, there were, actually, Councillor Netsky, you're... April 27th and May, the, May the 11th. April the 27th would be the date, okay? Yes, April 27th is a Strat Council session. Yeah, okay. Okay, so it's deferred to April 27th for, uh, for a follow-up on this, getting a subsequent um, 
person to be on the, uh, on the Aeronautics Management Committee. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, carried. Mm -hmm. Item number three, so moved. Uh, sorry, who was that? Uh, the Mayor. Uh, any questions on the parking agreement with the Kitchener Market? Councillor Gazzola. I'm just curious as to why we're, 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 we're giving them quite a subsidy. Is, and, you know, on what basis are we doing this? Uh, it, it is a, there is a substantial uh, difference between the rates, and I'm, I'm also surprised that uh, we're looking here at not increasing parking rates over the next four, four years. Uh, I, I, I just remember from going through our parking operation, which is suffering a loss, and we have a huge subsidization program, and this is just adding to it. So is there some way we can be a little... Mr. Redman? Through the chair, this um, rate structure was originally approved by council back in 2011. The original owner never actually tenanted that building, so nobody's actually ever exercised this rate structure, so the new owner has come to us and asked us to transfer, transfer this to them. So this would be up to 30 spots maximum for the Kitchener Market. Um, which is slightly outside of downtown, um, so there is a bit more vacancy in this property. Um, so staff um, are recommending this rate structure be tiered, keeping in mind that the first year was 2014, so they'd now be at the 2015 rate and phasing up to market rates in 2018. In terms of our um, ongoing budget, um, staff are in the 10-year forecast of proposed holding our um, parking rates at zero until 2017 when the LRT opens. And that's to increase customer base in the market or in the parking garages. Well, it is such a substantial difference. Uh, $105 to $155. I just thought we have an opportunity. We're, we're looking at a whole new ball game with a new owner that uh, should we not be uh, negotiating something better for the city? Is that not possible? And is, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading a report. Yes, Ms. Redmond? Through the chair, we have increased the rates um, with, with the inflationary increases that have happened at the parking structures versus the rates originally outlined in the 2011 report. So we are um, seeking additional funding from the tenants. Um, we think this is a fair rate based on the original rate structure that was approved by council back in 2011. Any further questions? All those in favor of? Okay, request for a recorded vote on uh, this item. You vote now. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Item number four, dog, uh, dangerous dog designation appeal. Moved by Councillor Fernandez. Any discussion? Uh, Councillor Davey? Go ahead, Councillor Davey. Uh, thank you. Just one question to the members of the committee. Just reading through the um, the conditions that are put on this uh, this dog, uh, it's a little murky. I just want to make sure I understand it correctly. So, if the if the owners do construct a fence, it's not required that there's also there also be a pen. The dog could be enclosed in the backyard in a fence, satisfactory to the pound keeper. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item number five, statement of remuneration expenses. I have a mover. For information. Councillor uh, Inez. It's for information. You don't need Any a motion? discussion? There's no motion. Councillor Etherington wants to speak to it, though. 
Can I ask a couple of questions on that item? On the issue of, on page 5-4, the issue of tickets and passes, Mr. Chapman, could you tell me what is the policy and if there is any limit on the amount that a councillor can spend on tickets and passes? The reason I ask is it seems to vary from zero to $619 in the year. And that 619 a councillor amount is almost double what the former mayor spent. I would have thought the mayor would be spending on that category. Can you give me some answers on that, Mr. Chairman? Well, Mr. May is there. Oh, Mr. May. Oh, so, excuse sorry, Mr. Chapman. Mr. Chapman. Yes. Uh, I can give you some answers. Um, there are policies in place that are public and approved by council. There are limits in those policies. Typically, these tickets and passes would relate to the municipal golf courses and events at the auditorium. Uh, I don't have those policies in front of me, so I can't quote the limits to you, but I could certainly circulate them after the fact. Well, maybe you could send them to me. The, uh, but it is for golf passes and odd tickets? Typically, yes. And my other question on page 5-7, the meeting expenses. I think I know the reason for those expenses. Uh, is there any limit on those expenses? And again, I ask because I note one item there for over $3,000. I presume that includes all expenses, flights, hotels, and everything, but can you clarify that for me? Through the chair, yes, typically anything reported as a conference <coughs> or a meeting expense would include all of the associated costs, transportation, accommodation, registration, and incidentals. Um, and I look for council members to confirm it, but it's my understanding under the most recent revision to the conference policy, uh, that did not apply to attendance at executive committee meetings with AMO and with FCM. So that would not be held against the council uh, annual limit for conference attendance. Yeah, this is separate from the conference budget. Am I correct? That's my understanding, yes. And do you know if there's any limit on that? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Davey. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on that last point. Um, I, I to sort of speak to Councillor Etherington's uh, concern about the, uh, the meeting expenses. Uh, when I brought forward the motion to limit uh, conference or not even to, to keep the budget essentially the same, but to allocate it equitably and more transparently among members of council, I'd considered the implications of the meeting expenses. And uh, the reason I left that out was specifically because I think it's a benefit to the city of Kitchener to, um, to have members of this, of this council if, they, if they're fortunate enough to get support to be on um, uh, any sort of board with respect to AMO or the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. So I specifically left that point off so it wouldn't count against their ability to attend other conferences. Okay, uh, do I, who, who moved that last You don't one? need a mover on that no? one. No, okay. That's just information. Oh, that's information, okay. I'll move item number six. Okay, Mayor moves item number six. Any discussion? All those in favor? Approved. Carried. Item number seven. Do you have a motion? Okay, I'll move it. I'm sorry, um, the mayor moves it. Uh, any discussion? Councillor Gazzola. I have a, c a couple of questions. Okay, go ahead. That, that I want. Uh, part of the additional costs here are for three new sites. Where, where are those sites? Oh, you're testing my memory. I, be I believe they're community arena sites to facilitate the provision of Wi-Fi at those arenas. The yeah. exact sites I don't have in front of me. Okay, well, there. Do are you able to tell me now that that all our sites are on Wi-Fi, or is this there's, that we're still not there, or what? Uh, there were two lists put in front of council. All of the first tier priorities have been implemented. We're now into the second tier. Um, and we're moving well through them. There are some where there are some major challenges or costs associated, so those will take longer, but we're making very good progress. 
Okay, the, the majority of this, of this contract is, is that we're having to pay for the hard wiring. Is that, is that right? It's for the provisioning of the fiber optic cable yeah. and the hardware to support it. Yeah. Are there any alternatives there to that, to, to what we have? Yes, uh, there are commercial options available in the market. Um, my understanding is that fundamentally the difference is right now we own completely this fiber optic cable and it has capacity up to 10 gigabytes. We, we own it? Basically, we own the rights to the entire cable as opposed to any other commercial offering where we would basically have a slice of the capacity but not the entire bandwidth. And I think as was noted previously by Mr. Murray, we essentially have a much higher service level at a much lower cost compared to what's available in the open market. But if we, if we own the cable, why, I don't understand why, what are we paying for? So sorry, that probably was not as precise as it could have been. We have, we have the rights to the entirety of the cable as opposed to other commercial offerings where you would simply have a portion of the capacity within the cable allocated to you. Okay, and the, okay, and just the, the other part, we, we not only have to pay for the cable, but we also have to pay for someone to manage that operation. Is there any alternative there than the way we're doing it? I think the alternative would be to try and manage it in-house between all of the participating agencies. The benefit of this approach is that given there are so many participants, if there are failures or issues within the network, we're all dealing with the same provider rather than having to try and coordinate efforts between many participating agencies. Okay, that's, that's all I wanted to hear, to, to sort of explain that. Thank you. Thank you. We have two more uh, questioners, Councillor Netsky, Councillor Fernandez. Go ahead. Uh, can, you, can staff just um, remind me what the uh, budget for this project was? Uh, I don't have that information in front of me, and I note that the, um, the financial terms are the subject of a confidentiality agreement, which is why they're not noted in the staff report here. Okay. Any other person? Councillor Singh. Go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Chapman, um, for public Wi-Fi, can you remind me on the second list, were our district parks, are they a part of that or were they not even included in the second list? I know the Victoria Park was included. I can't recall whether it was on the A or the B list, uh, but I know that we're moving ahead there. I, I don't believe that parks generally were covered off like in that the, second tier. Like McLennan or Qantas Park. I'm just trying to refer to the district parks. Yeah, I don't believe so. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, call for the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item number eight, encroachment agreement, Rogers Communications. Do I have a motion? Councillor uh, uh, Nainitis. Any discussion? Uh, Councillor Davey. Uh, thank you. Just, just one question of the financial implications. Um, being that we're dealing with, that it's Rogers, correct? Um, it says the minimum encroachment fee will be applicable. Could we apply the maximum encroachment fee? I just, I just get, I'm not, I'm being, I'm being flippant, but I mean, why specifically is the word minimum there? I just like to understand. Any further questions, Councillor Davy? Or uh, waiting for a response on that. Yeah. Oh. I don't think we can offer a satisfactory answer today, and so either um, you'll approve it and we can report back, or if it's material to the uh, approval tonight, I would suggest you defer it and we can report. It's back. it's a small amount, so I'll, I'll, I'll I'm happy to support it. But so if I could get some counsel with some more background on that. Very good, thank you. Any further questions? All those in favor of item eight? Opposed? Carried. Okay, I need a mover for the um, uh, committee to rise and report. Councillor uh, uh, Fernandez. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Back to you, Mayor. No, actually, you have to read. Uh, oh, sorry, that's right. I just got buried here. Um, that the proceedings and the recorded pecuniary interests and conflicts taken in the meeting of the Committee of the Whole held as date, as attached hereto, and forming part of these minutes, are hereby adopted and confirmed. And you had that seconded by whom? It was uh, by Councillor Fernandez. I need a second. Okay. So you're moving it, Councillor Fernandez. I'm moving it to second. Sorry, that's right. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. It's been moved by Councillor Singh, seconded by Councillor Gazzola, that the bylaws listed on the agenda for third reading be taken as read a third time, finally passed and numbered seriously by the clerk. 
All those in favor? Opposed, that's carried. And it's been moved by Councillor Schneider that we now adjourn. All in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, little guy, for surviving your first council meeting. <laughs>